7, 2017. Okay. I invite uh, you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by some students from Perry Hall Middle School. And if you bear with me, I'm going to um, give their names. Emily Fry, Monica Suspedis, Alec Robertson, Bryce Munesis, and Katie Hen. And I will add that Katie Hen happens to be the daughter of one of our board members. Um, after the uh, um, the pledge, I ask you to remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County, <laughs> and particularly to remember our friend, our former board member, George Maniotis, who passed away this week. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on our agenda is consideration of the uh, agenda itself. Uh, Dr. Dance, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, I would like to adjust and under new business contract awards, I would like to add item M11, HVAC equipment, installation, service, and related products to tonight's agenda. Uh, in accordance with policy 8314, an item may be added to the agenda by unanimous consent of the board members present. All in favor of adding M11, HVAC equipment installation, service, and related products to tonight's agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. And the agenda is revised. Mr. Chairman? Mrs. Miller. I move that the budget questions and answers that are posted on the BCPS website be also added to board docs for this meeting so that they become part of the permanent record. So that's not an agenda item, but it will be done. Great. Um, Thank you. Very good. Uh, next on our um, agenda is uh, the selection of speakers. Before I... Um, uh, well, let me say, sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled <coughs> board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The complete <coughs> sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in a box, um, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight's public comment portion of the meeting. Yolanda Square, Buckingham. Two. Thor Truesvazen. Va Three. Sue Doyle. Four. Kelly Matthews. Five. Dante Moore. Six. Yolanda Lewis. Three. Bosch Ferone. Eight. Tanisha Bird. Nine. Heather Bergen. Ten. Glenn Gihar. Uh, very good. Before we ask our advisory and stakeholders groups uh, representatives to come and speak, I'd like to recognize uh, two of our elected officials who are here this evening. Uh, Councilman David Marks is here. Uh, we thank you, Councilman, for being here, as well as Delegate Christian Mealy. Delegate, thanks for being here. Um, our first of the advisory and stakeholder group uh, speakers is uh, Tabco, and that's Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. First, I would like to add my regrets uh, to hear about George Maniotis. He was a gentleman beyond belief, and he will be sorely missed. Okay, tonight's story from the trenches comes from a special education teacher 
This story is not unique to this teacher, but points up the issues our special education teachers face day in and day out. This story is really more a typical day in the life of a special education teacher. This teacher is teaching not only special education students and general education students in class each day, but then has a caseload of 15 students who need updated IEPs using a brand new system that now takes at least three hours per student, if not more, to complete. On top of this, the teacher must test, score, and record data for each one of the students in her caseload and talk with her students, regular education teachers, to discuss how the students progress. She does not ever teach some of the same students, some of the students on her caseload. Therefore, the teacher must rely on information provided by other teachers about that student. On top of this, the teacher has to modify curriculum for the special needs students in her classes, mainly because the curriculum is not written for these students. During the school day, she serves on hall duty and cafeteria duty uh, several times a week and is often asked to cover classes for other teachers because substitute teachers are hard to come by in our school system. She is also tasked with meeting with teachers who teach her her 15 caseload students so they can plan together. This is all supposed to be accomplished with 50 minutes of planning each day. There is a reason we are having difficulty hiring enough special educators. When our special education teachers tell me they are seriously thinking of having their special education certification removed from their teaching certificates, they no longer have to teach time to teach special education, there is a problem. When special educators come to a TABCO meeting about special education issues and instead of 50 that signed up to attend, we had 80 show up. I know there are pressing, these are pressing issues. In negotiations this year, we have asked for additional case management of pl planning time for our special educators. This would barely touch the time needed just for dealing with their caseloads. If we are to begin to address the time issue facing these teachers, that case management, additional planning is just a drop in the bucket. But it would send a huge message to the teachers that someone is listening and willing to help. We continue to ask for many items through our negotiations to address the needs of our teachers. We do this because our teachers want to do the, what is best for our students. We need to provide them with the tools and time they need for the best outcome for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. I want to um, I'll tell you that your chair was racing through the agenda. We're going to continue the, uh, uh, the advisor and stakeholder speakers, but then we're going to go back to get back on agenda and, and ask uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. uh, so our next speaker is the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart-Sicking. Good evening to all of you. First, I want to acknowledge how pleased we are that the Office of Special Education and Special Educators will be included in summer curriculum writing. We have expressed concern in the past about the lack of special ed involvement in curriculum writing, and we want to thank the board and administration for beginning to take steps to respond to this need. As you know, CCAC has several priorities this year, one of which is getting to a minimum of two special educators in every elementary school. Special educators cover a wide range of grades with varied <coughs> curriculum and student needs. Imagine covering instruction or classroom strategies for six or seven grades, pre-K, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grades, then multiply that by every unit covered in math or reading and any other area of need, and then multiply all of that by a number of different disabilities. What we are asking is overwhelming, if not impossible. By increasing to a minimum of two or more special educators in every elementary school, at the very least, one special educator could focus on primary and another on intermediary grades or whatever breakdown works best. We also have concern over teacher retention. I, along with others, have said over and over again that current expectations for teachers are too great. We don't have any hope of retaining teachers when we keep overloading them and offering them too little support. We cannot go on expecting classroom teachers to bear the burden of short staffing in special education. Our special ed students, typical students, and all teachers suffer. We at CCAC continue to insist that special ed staffing is good for everyone. Special ed teachers need reduced caseloads. General ed teachers need more support and resources. 
special ed students, and typical students need proper attention. From our, our perspective, additional special ed positions cannot be negotiable. This seems a given with all the issues at hand, but it isn't a given. In fact, last year, it appeared as though everyone agreed on the importance of more full-time special ed positions, and then positions were eliminated at the very end of budget planning. I urge you to maintain increased special ed staffing as non-negotiable. We cannot keep saying case overload and teacher retention are problems, and then at the same time continue to ignore special education staffing, particularly when it comes to teachers in our schools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is the PTA Council of Baltimore County Representative Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Johnson, Board of Ed members, and Dr. Dance. I'm Leslie Weber, PTA Council of Baltimore County Ch Communications Chair, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Emory Young. At our February Board of Directors meeting last week, we voted to support and oppose legislation coming before the Maryland General Assembly. We voted to support House Bill 866, Primary and Sec Secondary Education, Health and Safety Guidelines and Procedures, Digital Devices. Of the 25 bill co-sponsors, seven are from Baltimore County. This bill would require, require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, in consultation with the State Department of Education, to develop health and safety guidelines and procedures for the use of digital devices in public school classrooms. PTA Council has testified at past Board of Ed meetings regarding health concerns tied to device use, including ergonomics, eye health, emotional well-being, and social brain and fine motor development. PTA Council also voted to support a local bill, House Bill 88, Education Selection of Members to the Board, the Baltimore County School Board, which would control when Board of Education appointments are made and would alter the terms of certain appointed members. The bill would strengthen the nominating commission by requiring it to hold a certain number of meetings each year, each in a separate councilmanic district, and requiring the commission to appoint its own chairperson. Finally, we voted to oppose a local bill, House Bill 582, Baltimore County Public School System Magnet Program, selection of students for admission to middle school, to, for admission to middle school, which would allow only applicants demonstrating high academic achievement and readiness to enroll in the lottery for admission to middle school magnet programs. PTA Council believes that students should have equal access to magnet school programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is the ESPBC representative. That's the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, uh, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Dance and members of Baltimore County Board of Education. My name is Lila Marinbloom, and I am president of the Support Professionals of Baltimore County. I am here to speak about the need for staffing and how this need has affected the working conditions of our educational support staff in Baltimore County. The dedicated support staff have been put in a position of preventing them from focusing on the very reason they come to work, <coughs> supporting the instructional needs of students. While there was a change this year in the master agreement, putting a cap on the amount of time paraeducators could be used to substitute for teachers, the schools are grossly understaffed and substitutes are in short supply. This leaves the paraeducator not servicing the students they were hired to support many of whom have IEPs with specific needs and services. We are expected to serve as substitutes for grade level meetings, team meetings, and any other time when a teacher is out of the building. Administrators even encourage us not to take days off as it would pose an undue hardship on the remaining staff in the building and or ask us to secure our own substitutes. This, of course, is a violation of our master agreement. 
the solution to this situation is to increase staffing. I know that there are office professionals who are not able to meet the demands of their work. Can you imagine registering a family whose first language is not English, maintaining accurate files for students who transfer, and sending out notifications for IEP meetings all while being continually interrupted to answer office phones and let visitors into the building. This brings multitasking to a whole new level. Many office professionals need time to complete the tasks they, were, uh, they had to leave incomplete because of, their con because of the continual interruptions that occurred during the day. What some office professionals face is administrators telling them they need to work more efficiently, when in fact, what is needed is more staffing. Thank you for your time, and I hope that, my, that you hear our plight and do what is best for the staff and students of Baltimore County. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next uh, two speakers are Area Education Advisory Council representatives. The first from the Central, that's Amy Freeman. Good evening, board members, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Tonight you will be voting on the proposed fiscal year 2018 operating budget. Over the past several weeks, you've received input from various stakeholders via email, phone calls, public hearings, and workshops. Many questions have been raised, and I truly appreciate the tremendous efforts BCPS administration has, provided, has done in providing responses to those questions. Before you cast your vote on this proposed budget, please consider this very basic question. Does this budget adequately address the true needs of BCPS students? For me and many in the central area, the answer is no. It does not address the serious need for reducing teacher-student ratios. It does not address the need for more guidance counselors, social workers, pupil, pupil personnel workers. The BCPS professional ratio to students for these are way below guideline recommendations. We have, for example, individual guidance counselors managing 500 to 600 cases. We have individual social workers managing over 1,000 students. These are vital supports our BCPS students desperately need, supports they are not receiving because current demands cannot um, possibly be met. As chair of the central Oh, sorry. The budget proposal prioritizes digital instruction initiatives over improving the ability of BCPS to meet the be basic needs of its students. As chair of the Central Area Education Advisory Council, I can tell you that none of the questions or concerns related to school funding that I have heard over recent years from stakeholders in our community have referenced in any way a need to redirect funding so that every student has a device. To the contrary, I have heard from many community members, including parents and teachers, that the money being used to fund the STAT initiative is too much, considering the true needs of students and teachers in every BCPS classroom. Our teachers and support staff are amazing, but they are overworked and overwhelmed. Nearly half of BCPS students are living in poverty. These are the real issues we need to consider when looking at the proposed budget. And these issues are not prioritized in this budget. So please, take this into consideration when you cast your vote for this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the Northeast AAC, uh, Lily Lee. Thank you. Uh, I'm speaking for Perry, Perry Home Meadow PTSA president, and her name is Christine Hagen. She cannot come tonight, so I'm going to read her remarks about the Perry Home Meadow overcrowding crisis. And that's her remarks. 
Paraho Middle School is a very good school. It's filled, it's filled with quality administrators, some truly outstanding teachers, friendly support staff, and more than 1,860 students. Next year, you will have even have more students, and the year after, more students. Year and year, more and more students. So at some point, the number will be too many for the quality administrators and the outstanding, outstanding teachers, friends, and support staff. Many of them will probably have to leave for schools with classes that are smaller. They want, want to deal with shortage of classroom space, learning cottages where baseball diamonds used to be, a lack of lockers, an average class size in the 30s, and special classes close to 40. And the feeling of, of insecurity that comes from being in a perpetual crowd. So what about the students? The ones that are now there are riding crowded buses, eating lunch during breakfast hours, and navigating jam-packed hallways will be replaced by next group of students, the ones waiting in the wings at our old crowded elementary schools, never thinking that things will get better. But no, when they go there, the, the, the problem will travel with them. But unlike teachers, administrators, and staff that can leave when situation worsens, our students cannot, they will be sick of it. So the population of Perro Middle School, when, where I'm PTSA president this year, was more than three, was more than 200 students over capacity in August. Student enrollment was more than 40, uh, greater than anticipated for the start of the year. Next year's population will, pro will be larger than this year, and a, a trend that's, that's projected to continue for a decade or longer. That's why I'm submitting comments to the Board of Education tonight. The Perro Middle School community is upset by the Board of Education's decision not to set aside any funding to address overcrowding situation in our community at the middle school level next year. And uh, this has frustrated many of the parents. Well, I don't think anyone expects a solution next year. They would expect some dialogue. Will there be redistricting? Will there be a new school? How many trailers are there in our future? What will you do when the students that are overcrowded in the elementary schools get to our overcrowded in the middle school? What happens when they get to high school? <laughs> so I ask you, on behalf of my members and as a parent with two children in the BCPS system, please prioritize <coughs> our side of town. Talk to parents, talk to teachers, tell us what options available. Please develop a plan, a proactive plan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lee and thank Ms. Hagen for her written comments. Now we're back on track and we're gonna to go to agenda item E and that's Dr. Dance's uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. First of all, I would like to just uh, thank all BCPS staff members, particularly George Sarris, our Executive Director of Fiscal Services, Whit Tentliff, our Director of Budget, uh, for working with me over the last uh, probably 10, 11 months as we put together our FY proposed budget for the board's consideration this evening. Um, in addition, we've answered over 130 questions um, in writing from our community and from our board related to the proposal that the board would consider uh, this evening. So I just want to personally thank them for their hard work and along with your team, so thank you. Um, last week, we were notified by the Maryland State Department of Education that our class of 2016 graduation rate reached an all-time high of 89.2%. And this is the sixth year in a row that Baltimore County Public Schools has increased its graduation rate. And while you look at traditionally a very large school system having a graduation rate that high, I think what the team celebrated the most was that when you look at the gaps between our groups, they improved all across the board. Particularly, if you look at our two largest student subgroups, our African-American students and our white students, there is statistically no achievement gap when it's related to those two, two student demographics when it comes to graduation. This is because of the hard work, not just of our principals and their staff, but really our elementary, our middle school teachers and principals, and our support staff um, for all the work that they've done to make sure our kids stay on track uh, for graduation. So that was the intro for the graduation rate. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> Um, our community has asked for some information on the Elementary and Secondary um, Education Act, which is now the Every Student Succeeds Act. And I think there is this belief that uh, many school systems will have a little bit more autonomy um, because of the reauthorization of the act. However, states have more authority to figure out what route they want to they want to go. We also are waiting for some direction from the new administration around accountability and some of the other regulations that have been most recently pulled back. 
However, the BCPS master plan, uh, plan aligns up very well with the current Every Student Succeeds Act, particularly in areas of a focus on growth and reading, math, and in language acquisition for our students, determining growth targets by student group by cutting non-proficiency in half by the year 2030, and offering high school math courses to our students as early as sixth grade. Um, as one of the superintendent representatives on the state group, I continue to work with the state around clarification on three items, um, providing equitable comparisons of secondary math achievement to make sure we're measuring apples to apples, measuring language acquisition and translating of bridge plans, and accurately measuring growth across the board. Um, also want to take the opportunity to remind everyone that the BCPS stakeholder survey is now out. Um, currently, after eight days, we have close to 29,000 uh, responses. Again, this goes to every student in grades 4 through 12 who can participate. Our staff, our community members can participate in this as well. Um, if you have students in multiple schools, you can take the survey more than once um, to, to signify the role that you're in. So I'm encouraging everyone um, to continue taking the BCPS stakeholder uh, survey. Um, I am um, excited to see the Perry Hall Middle School community out tonight. Um, I want to share some information uh, regarding Perry Hall. Um, I, I want to let you know that I totally share with your concern um, as a former middle school principal on the size of Perry Hall Middle School. Um, and when we put together our county and our state capital budget request for the board's consideration, I meet with all elected officials. Back in September, um, I actually had an opportunity to meet with members of county council, which included Councilman Marks, who represents the area. We did all agree at the particular time that we would make sure we prioritize air conditioning for our schools, our high school renovation projects, the renovation in addition at Pedonia International School, and make sure that we actually had seats for elementary students in the Northeast area. Um, I want to go on record that at no time as superintendent did I ever promise secondary seats for fiscal year 18. As a matter of fact, we brought to the board um, in August of 2016 the request for fiscal year 18, which was our state request. The board got it for first read in August, and they actually approved it in September. When we actually brought the December request to the board, which was the county capital request, it mirrored the state request outside of a few local projects. However, all that being said, um, I have been in contact with board members who represent the Perry Hall area. I've been in contact with elected officials at the county council and the state level. To let you know, this is a priority for ours going forward, not just in Perry Hall, but the fact that we have a few other middle schools that are overcrowded. And if you look at our updated enrollment projections, which will become public in the next two weeks, every single high school in Baltimore County, except for about seven, will be at or above capacity in the next five years. So we don't want to recommend projects that actually will solve one problem while creating another. But the Perry Hall Middle School community, trust me, I hear you. I will be on it. Um, as we go into uh, later in the spring, reminder that in May of 2017, we will have our public hearing on our FY19 capital request. Um, but Perry Hall Middle School is on my radar. As I met with staff, uh, just yesterday, we did talk about looking at working with Principal Perry and looking at any additional needs that Perry Hall has to have for next year. We did increase administrative staffing. We increase, uh, increased nursing staffing at the school. Class sizes for Perry Hall Middle School matched Perry, uh, class sizes around the entire county. However, we do want to make sure we're supporting the principal in whatever she needs to operate for the 18 or for the 17-18 school year. But we will have this on our radar as we go into the next uh, capital budget. And last but not least, um, I think I share in, in, in some, of the um, some of the voices that uh, Ms. Baden said and also our chair said that it's been a tough last three days. Um, when I was informed Saturday night on the passing of George Maniotis, as I shared with the Baltimore Sun, I felt like I lost one of my best friends. Uh, so it's no secret that uh, Mr. Maniotis was one of the board members who hired me. He became a friend of mine because we shared the same thing, and that's every single student deserves access to a quality education. So rest in peace, George. I miss you, and I wish you and your family, um, in your time of grief, um, know that we're with you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Next on the agenda is the chair's report, uh, and I'll begin by uh, saying that on behalf of the board, I, uh, too, offer condolences to the Monty Otis family, and um, I will indeed miss George even after he left the board, he stayed in touch with many of us and stayed concerned about Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, our board is at an important juncture. Uh, the operating budget for fiscal year 18 will be voted on tonight. This is the last to be fully overseen uh, by us. Um, the next uh, operating budget, the 2019 operating budget, will be the last to be considered by this board, uh, but it uh, uh, will be um, only overseen by this board for half of the time, and the rest of the, uh, the second half of the 19 uh, budget will be uh, overseen by the new uh, partially appointed, partially elected hybrid board. Um, we are, uh, uh, 
we're going to move toward this new day uh, uh, as a board and do our best to afford a smooth and a seamless transition. All boards uh, function best when there is trust among board members. From trust follows cooperation, and from cooperation comes good governance. Uh, we will strive to build trust as we continue to seek and achieve good governance. Next is uh, our student board member, Aislinn Bratt. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, since last meeting, we hosted our very first ever student member of the board interest meeting with uh, the Baltimore County Student Council and BCPS TV. This event was part of our effort to increase the information and support available <coughs> to interested candidates and their families. I'd like to thank everyone who made the event possible and the amazing candidates that attended the meeting. For those looking for more information, visit the Baltimore County Student Council page on the BCPS website where you can find the interest meeting, the position description, and the application, which is due this Friday. So if you have an interested candidate, make sure you give them a tap on the shoulder, remind them it's due soon. I would also like to update everyone on the work the Baltimore County Student Council has been up to. This past weekend, uh, myself and about 14 other BCPS students attended LEAD DC, a national conference for student leadership. It was an amazing opportunity for students to collaborate on new ideas and engage in workshops to explore their leadership potential. I'd like to extend thanks to our amazing chaperones and mentors and um, just remind everyone that the next meeting of the Baltimore County Student Council will be tomorrow at Greenwood. So that is the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brett. Our next item, public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive advice of community members. Uh, the members of this board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the appropriate forum to address specific uh, student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. Um, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Our first speaker is Yolanda Square Buckingham. Good evening. Um, I am the current PTA president for the Deer Park Middle Magnet School for 2016-2017. My reason for being here today is that I feel as if our school is in dire need of some intervention. Um, I, as a PTA president, receive calls from parents on a regular, on a daily basis about issues that um, involve their children and these issues are not being resolved in a timely manner in order to prevent other issues from um, evolving from those as things such as fighting, um, people being bullied, um, teachers not answering in a timely manner, um, grades not being put into the system, parents not being keep, kept aware of what's going on with their children. Um, and I do have some personal experience in that area myself. So today we have several parents and students here from the Deer Park Middle Magnet School, and we're here to ask the board if they would send some intervention our way. Um, there are many, many parents who would have liked to have been here, but due to the capacity um, opted to let certain other parents and the PTA board members um, come to speak to you today. Um, we are very, very concerned about our school. We are extremely concerned about our school. Um, we are in a process of talking to Mr. Mustafer and Dr. Koyar, and also I have called Dr. Dance's office in order to get some resolution. We can't go any longer the way we're going currently. Kids are being beat up. Um, kids are failing because they can't get what they need from the teachers because when the parents are emailing teachers, they're not getting responses back. Um, parents, other parents are trying to resolve issues by speaking to other parents, but when they're asking to have community meetings, they're not given in a timely manner and then fights ensue, people are hurt. 
Um, and we want to prevent this. We want our children to be able to go to school, feel safe, and know that their teachers have their backs, as well as their administrators, as well as the county at large. Because we are, understand that if our kids are not feeling safe in school, they're not going to progress the way they need to progress. And so I'm here today to ask you to please, whatever it is that you can do for our school, we need immediate intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Thor Trigvison. Good evening, members of the BCPS board. I'm here with the parents for, from Perry Hall and Kingsville to express our concern about the overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School. Let me first take you back to October 6, 2016, the day that I first asked the board to provide a plan to mitigate the current 111% overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School and the expected future 126% overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School within five years. Fast forward to today, you must love my emails. Because four emails later, the board still hasn't responded to my requests. As a father of children that are going to attend Perry Hall Middle School, I am genuinely worried about the overcrowding situation at Perry Hall Middle and the inability of the board to act on it. I have asked for the information in my, uh, for five items in my emails to the board. Uh, members of the board, you have not responded to any of my emails. For your convenience, I will go through them quickly once again. Provide, one, provide a document by the county fire department that Perry Hall Middle School is in compliance with fire safety codes for the current 111% overcrowding and 125% <coughs> overcrowding. Provide uh, a detailed report on support staff per student at Perry Hall Middle School compared to other middle schools in the county, including nursing, librarians, STEM teachers, books per student in the library, and support staff. Action plan four, action plan on how you will deal with overcrowding on school buses at Perry Hall Middle School. Five, action plan on addressing overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School, both short-term plan and a permanent solution. Dr. Dance, your assurance and commitment to Councilman David Marks that the board would address the overcrowding have so far, to the best of my knowledge, been empty promises. Dr. Dance, you must lead the board and carry the interests of the children in Perry Hall at heart. We, the parents of children in Kingsville and Perry Hall that are destined for Perry Hall Middle School, need a written assurance from the board that it will act on our behalf with the best interest of the children as its guiding light. Verbal assurance is no longer sufficient. 111% overcrowding is bad. 125% in 2023 is a critical issue, and a board paralyzed by lack of action is unacceptable. I trust that in spite of your inability to act so far on your word to Councilman David Marks, we will see funding for action in the Perry Hall area on the next fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is. Our next speaker is Sue Doyle. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Sue Doyle. I've been a resident of Perry Hall my entire life. I'm a graduate. My son's a graduate. My daughter's graduating next year. And my youngest daughter is a student at Perry Hall Middle School. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the buses pull out of the school parking lot. Kids are standing or sitting in between the, the seats on the aisles. I'm not sure if you've been through the hallways when classes change. I have. And it's a scary experience. Imagine being a sixth grader walking into that school, being shoved and pushed into the lockers, no teacher, no staff in sight, because they are underfunded. They are overcrowded. Going to a, a nurse appointment or going to the nurse's office for a simple headache for a Tylenol takes over an hour. And I know this because my daughter has texted me on several occasions begging me to come tell the nurse that she needs a Tylenol. And I did. And my daughter got sent to the office for texting her mother after sitting in the nurse's office for 50 minutes. This is unacceptable. 
No child should have to be scared to walk through the halls because of the overcrowding. There are fights happening in the hallways that the teachers aren't aware of because there aren't enough staff members there to oversee that amount of children. Now, flash forward in five years. Imagine what it's gonna be like then. We need the funding to start finding a resolution. If we don't start looking for a resolution now, we're just putting any kind of possibility of fixing this problem off for another two or three years. Groundbreaking wouldn't happen for another seven from now as it stands. There's no excuse for this. We have been told time and time again that it's going to happen. We'll look into it. We'll make sure that all the support services are there. Yes, there's a librarian and a nurse, and there's guidance counselors. But can you imagine being a child going to school, wearing your winter coat on a rainy, cold day? You go into the school, you put your coat in the locker. Second class in, you're eating lunch at 945. After that, you don't get to go get your coat, but you've got to walk outside across the grass in the, the nastiness and the coldness, and you don't have time to get a coat. Then you go through the rest of your day with cold and wet shoes and hair and everything else and your books are soaked because you had to go to a trailer and then you get to be stuffed on a bus like a sardine and sent home. There's no oversight here and we need help at Perry Hall Middle School. We need somebody, we need this board to look at this problem now, not a year from now, not two years from now. I've watched this problem grow for the last three decades. It can't wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Matthews. <laughs> Kelly Matthews. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Kelly Matthews. I have a daughter that attends Deer Park Middle Magnet School. She's a vocal magnet um, person. Um, I have had to visit, I have another child that goes to another middle school, and I have had to visit Deer Park more times than I've ever had to visit my other daughter's school for concerns. The school is overpopulated. Um, it's not conducive for our children's learning. They can't learn in that type of environment. My daughter tests on a ninth grade average, but I don't see that continuing. Her grades are dropping. Um, she dreads going to school. Um, it's hard not to make this personal because it is personal. That's my child. She's not expendable. I want her to have the best education that she can. I can't homeschool her, and I can't afford to put her in private school, so I feel like if I send her to a school, she should be able to get um, the best education afforded to her, but she can't do that in overpopulated classes and classes that are so disrupted, disruptive. I've had to um, have her removed from one of her classes because the teacher had no control over the classes. The kids are pushing and they're throwing things and it's loud and they're doing everything but learning. So I just need some help in trying to figure out what I can do to help my child and the other children because it's important for their future that they're able to get everything they, that they can out of being in school, and I don't feel like that's afforded to them in these type of environments. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dante Moore. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. My name is Dante Moore. I'm currently the vice president at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Today we have more in attendance, more than 10 in attendance, with several um, concerns pertaining to the administration and the safety at the school. So of course all of us can't speak. We also have a few students in attendance that has several issues um, that they would like to bring to your attention. Of course we know today is not the time to do so. Um, like I said, we have more than 10 in attendance. And what I'm really like to ask is that at least one of you attend our next PTA meeting, which will be held on February the 28th at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. My email address is more, M-O-O-R-E, Dante, D-O-N-T-A-Y, at gmail. 
I can always be reached um, through email. But um, we have a lot of the same issues that Perry Hall Magnet School, I mean, Perry Hall Middle School is having, and it seems to be a problem in Baltimore County Public Schools. I have a oldest, I have a youngest, my youngest son is in the eighth grade at Deer Park. Um, my oldest is in the 10th grade. He's in a private school. He's not in a private school because I can necessarily afford it. He's in a private school because I'm making sacrifices for him to receive a better education that he should be receiving in Baltimore County Public School. I purchased my home in 2004, thinking that there were decent schools in the area because of the MHA, the MSA scores and the HSA scores. And that was one of the main reasons that I purchased my home. Since then, of course, I'm sure you all can see that things have changed. What I'm asking is that someone take time to pay attention to our school and our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yolanda Lewis. Yolanda Lewis. Good evening. Good evening. This is my first time having to deal with the situation at Deer Park Middle Magnet. My daughter is in the seventh grade. She did not want to go to Deer Park Middle Magnet even when she was in elementary school because of the situations, the, the bullying and things of that nature. Last Tuesday, a student in her class cut her hair. I have not heard anything from a principal. No one has contacted me. And this is totally unacceptable. My daughter, she has, she came home today and she called me and she did say that the gentleman was back in class and she wants to be moved out of that class. She has an A in that class and I don't feel as though that she needs to be moved. We keep having the same issues with these same particular boys in the class and they'll be suspended they'll go to another school or whatever and they'll come back so that is one of my issues that i have um, the cameras in the school we keep telling we were told that the cameras are not working and that's an issue that has been several fights and for some reason when there's a fight going on and the child tries to protect themselves they're told well due to due process that they have to walk away. So how many times does a student have to walk away from continually being bullied? I don't know what you guys can do, but as has been stated before, that something needs to be done and it needs to be done as soon as possible. The kids are scared, the parents are scared, and I don't know what, have, what has to happen for action to be done. Now, if this particular boy cuts my child hair again, what's, what is the answer? No one has an answer. No one has contacted me from the school and say, Ms. Lewis, this is what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Perone. Good evening to all. Good evening. Today I would like, before speaking my three minutes, to recognize one honorable board member for the shining light that the board member has added to this board and the excellence in the school system about education, about safety, equity, and equality. I would say that it's really not enough for board members to just sit and enjoy the prestige on the Board of Education. It's really important to have leadership and to be active on the board. And with that, I, I really want to recognize Ms. Romaine Williams for the way the PRC works. And of course, it's not really just Ms. Williams, it's, it's really the members with her. But, um, you know, addressing issues, whether it's the air conditioners, whether it is the holidays, the conduct of the school system uh, in that PRC, allowing me to attend after the PRC has been closed from the public for a very long time. 
and I truly honor that and I really truly appreciate that. Having said that, today, the people who speak up are the ones who are going to save the United States of America. The people who really value the First Amendment are the ones who are going to save all of us. And I really appreciate your work that you have done for a long time. I appreciate the time that you really stated uh, for the community. We hear you. This is really something important for the people to know and believe and to trust, to use our chair uh, word, that the board members really hear the public. Having said that, over my 13 years, and today is the beginning of 14 years of addressing the board, there's always shortage. And I honestly don't know what's wrong with the Board of Education members. You just put the number of dollars that you need to fix the air conditioners and the buildings and to have enough counselors and to have enough substitutes and to have enough teachers and just really put it up for the county and the state and the federal government, right? You just do it. You don't have to really deal with the politics behind. This is really what the Board of Education is. It's independent. And I really think that would be the way to go so the public would have confidence and trust in the Board of Education. Ask the money that we need and let the other guys higher than us decide whether they want to give it to us or whether they want to play politics. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tanisha Bird. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank everyone for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm going to talk kind of fast because I have so much to say in so little time. Um, first off, my daughter is a seventh grader at Deer Park Middle Magnet. Um, I have been experiencing issues at Deer Park since last school year. Last year, my daughter was walking down the hall. A gentleman was running. She was knocked up in the air. Um, she was unconscious. She don't remember what happened. She did not know. A teacher escorted her to class along with another student. I then had to get permission from that student's parent to question the student to see what happened with my daughter because the teacher wrote no incident report, the teacher wrote nothing. Per take her to Northwest Hospital, she had a concussion. This school year, on January the 19th, 2017, I filed the incident report, a bullying report on a student at the school. The same student that I filed the bullying report on February the 19th is the same student that slapped my daughter on Friday in the cafeteria. He slapped her so hard that she was knocked unconscious onto the floor. She hit her head once again. I had to question her friends, get permission from their parents for them to let me know what happened to my daughter. They then took her phone and they called me. I was able to get from downtown Baltimore from my job to Deer Park Middle Magnet School in Randallstown before administrator called me. To this day, uh, administrators still have not called me. I have called Mr. Musterford's office on February the 3rd, Friday. I continue to call Mr. Musterford's office. I've called Dr. Dance's office. When I call Dr. Dance's office, they tell me I need to speak to Mr. Musterford's office. I'm constantly calling. We need help. We need help at the school. I'm also the PTA fundraising chair. I make myself available. I'm at Deer Park. When I'm in Deer Park, I see students hooking class in the hallways. I see fights breaking out in the school. I'm walking through the hallway, and it's so crowded that I have students knocking me down as a parent because they don't even respect the authority or see me there. It, it, it's no, we, we need intervention. I'm begging. My daughter can be killed. My daughter is terrified to go back to school. Moving forward, I will not send her back to Deer Park Middle Magnet until a principal calls me or Dr. Dance himself or Mr. Motherford to let me know what is the plan for my daughter, what is the action for my daughter. Is it okay that she go to school and get slapped again and knocked out on the floor? Well, we may not make it to Northwest to go to the hospital to determine a head injury. She may not make it. I may plan a funeral. 
So moving forward, I'm terrified as a parent and my daughter's terrified as a student. I'm begging for your help. I'm begging for the board's help for my school. We need you. If we've never needed you before, we need an intervention at Deer Park. More than half of the parents that spoke out of your 10 parents tonight have been from Deer Park Middle Magnet. There's a problem. We are begging for your help. We need you. We don't know what to do as parents moving forward. We have no support system. We don't know what to do. Please help us. Our next speaker is Heather Bergen. Heather Bergen. Good evening. Um, I didn't think I'd get chosen to speak, so I didn't really have much prepared, but um, my name is Heather Bergen. I'm a parent at Perry Hall Middle School. I currently have two children that attend there. My daughter is one of the 700, some 706th graders at Perry Hall Middle School because we are at 1,850 students in a middle school. 1,850 students in a middle school. That is completely ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We are the largest middle school in the state of Maryland. We are larger than most high schools in the county. 1,850 students. I'm not even gonna read what I wrote down. It's because now that I'm looking at all of you, you have got to understand, trailers are not a solution. A temporary solution is not acceptable. Two years ago, Dr. Dance stood in the cafeteria at Perry Hall High School and met with stakeholders, students, and parents. He told us then that Perry Hall Middle was on his radar. And here we are two and a half years later, and still nothing is being done. This is absolutely unacceptable. It is unacceptable. 1,850 students, and we are projected to be over 2,000 in the next few years. There should be ground being dug up right now as I am speaking to build another school. This is unacceptable and completely ridiculous. I don't know what else to say. We need your help. We need the funding. We cannot be ignored any longer. We're at the point now where we're ready to start protesting in front of the school to bring it more attention to the situation. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be disruptive but it's getting to that point. We need your help now. We need funding now to start a feasibility study for building a middle school in the Northeast area. I'm sorry, Dr. Dance, but being on your radar is not enough. It is time to act now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Glenn Gielhar. Glenn Gielhar. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dan. Distinguished members of the Board of Education, Good thank evening. you all for your service to our community. Um, I'm a graduate of Parkville Elementary, middle, and high school. Um, this is my home. Um, in a, in in the Parkville Lock Raven area, right now our schools, elementary, are overcrowded. Um, the latest numbers I saw show Oakley Elementary at almost 130% capacity. Uh, Fullerton Elementary is almost 140% over capacity. Um, Pleasant Plains is over capacity, and so is Villa Cresta. And one of the reasons these schools are, are um, over capacity is because a decision that was made nearly 40 years ago by your predecessors on this board to close Lock Raven Elementary and Parkville Elementary. Yes, the school I went to at Hiss Avenue and Hartford Road, which is now the Parkville Senior Center. Um, so they consolidated five schools, uh, Parkville, um, Oakley, Villa Cresta, Lock Raven, and Pleasant Plains, five schools in the three. And what I am suggesting doing is, is that either we build a new school in the Parkville area or Look at reopening the old Parkville Elementary School. Um, what you would do by doing that is, uh, is you would reverse the closing of that school, which would bring students out of 
Oakley and out of Villa Cresta, and also create space for Pleasant Plains to move over into uh, uh, Oakley and Villa Cresta, which are both outstanding schools. And, and actually, if you add capacity to Parkville Elementary, uh, you, you may even have some room to give some relief to, to Fullerton. Uh, it's a great it was a great school when it was open. The community was very involved. I love community schools because you have that community involvement that you don't have with the school that's out in the middle of Rossville Boulevard or Bella Road or someplace like that. I think an elementary school needs to be in a community. Um, also, I want to touch real quick on the situation in Perry Hall. Um, one of the reasons that um, uh, Perry Hall Middle is so overcrowded, is we've experienced unprecedented growth in the Perry Hall area. It's been one of the economic bright spots in Baltimore County. Um, people are moving there because they want to go to our great schools. Um, so we have new housing developments, um, new commercial establishments, bringing jobs, increasing our tax base. And one of my concerns is if you don't add seats to Perry Hall Middle, you really are running the risk at stifling that growth. And I'm sure there's uh, our neighbors up in Hartford County would love to have those private sector investment dollars go up into their county. I want those resources here. I want them to come to our school so that we can provide textbooks and more resources for our teachers. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item I, and it is uh, the consideration of policies for third readers. And for that, I call upon the chair of the um, policy committee, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone, my fellow board members. Um, the Board of Education Policy Review Committee asked the board accept the committee's recommendations to amend board policies 3150, 3225, and 6,000 and to delete policy 6601 and 6604, which are presented to you tonight on the uh, board's agenda as exhibit I. Also, I just want to share that the committee considered public comments received at the board's January 10th and January 24th meeting. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the PRC, the Policy Review Committee? So moved. All right, there's no need for a second. Any discussion? Could we break out? 6,600. We can break out 6,000, 6, 6,601. Which one are you? Uh, well, they, they really kind of go together. So you could say 6,600, 6,601, and 6. All right. Um, so let's then break those out. Mrs. Causey. Uh, yes, I wanted to break up policy 3150 and 3225. Let's do them one at a time. Yeah, there you It'll go. It'll be quick. <laughs> All righty. So we have a motion to accept all of them, but we're going to vote on them one at a time. The first is policy 3150. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey. Uh, Mr. Chair, in uh, policy 3150 in the revision, it has um, paragraph 2A. Um, the board, the superintendent shall ensure that adequate insurance programs are in place to minimize the adverse impacts of risks and losses to the school system and to notify employees of their reporting responsibilities, which is reasonable. My question relates to the superintendent's rule where they deleted, um, they deleted on page three of rule 3150 um, under paragraph three, item original B, they deleted employees shall immediately report all property loss and damage in accordance with procedures outlined in the critical response and school emergency safety management guide. So I'm just curious why that was deleted when the policy expressly says um, that the superintendent needs to notify employees of their reporting responsibilities. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll state that the uh, board's job is to implement and vote on policies. The superintendent's is to vote on rules. So we're here to consider policy 3150. Yes, and if, there, if there's an answer that can clarify that, then we can move on. Otherwise, I would make an amendment to put uh, in just a sentence in the policy that the employees must report Employees shall immediately report all property loss and damage in accordance with procedures outlined in the critical response. So, 
Is John, John, can you speak to that, please? It may just Dr. have been Mayo. an oversight that we left that out. The, in the rule, um, this section is called, I was referencing, um, the Office of Risk Management, currently there are processes and procedures are in place that an individual must follow um, for, this, for, for them to apply for some type of claim if they need to uh, uh, place a claim for some type of event. So somewhere else, there is a statement that employees are informed that they shall immediately report all property loss and damage in accordance with procedures. Right. And the procedures so that are is somewhere within else. Risk management. Yes, it's within the Office of Risk Management. In the Office of Risk Management. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Any other discussion on 3150? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The next item is policy 3225. Is there any discussion on 3225, Mrs. Causey? Um, in rereading it, the, we had worked on this in the policy review committee, and there were, um, as memory serves, there were uh, wording changes made to it, and I believe that we did not get one done correctly. In, uh, on page one, paragraph two, item B, it says the purchase of furniture, fixtures, and equipment shall comply with applicable state and local laws and regulations and support the educational, functional, and architectural requirements and design of any school building. But in fact, each school building may have different architectural requirements based on whether it's an elementary school, a middle school, a high school, whether it's a magnet, whether it's, we have um, three schools um, that are specific for special needs, we have other schools that are specific for other needs. So I think the word the was in and that should remain in. So I would ask my, the staff and or the uh, fellow members of the PRC committee if that word should be changed. Just to be clear, you're suggesting that the word any should be deleted and the word the should be replaced? Yes. Is there any comment about that? Mr. Ulfelder. It makes no sense if you say the building because you're not referencing any building. Any building references every building within the school system. The yes. building means absolutely nothing. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? We'll take Ms. Causey's uh, comment as a motion to amend. Any discussion on Ms. Any, I need a second on Ms. Causey's motion to amend. Second. There's a second. Any discussion on that other than Mr. Ulfelder's comment? All right, all in favor of the uh, motion to amend by replacing any and placing the in its right. place, please say aye. Is that an aye? For my motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the motion, the uh, motion to amend fails. So now we're back on 3225 two, two, uh, presented by the Policy and Review Committee. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 3225. 3225 passes or is accepted. Uh, next is 6,000. Any discussion on 6,000? Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, it's 660. It's the, I'm reading the wrong one. Six, policy 6600. Um, I, I wanted to understand the impetus behind this change and can, can someone explain how the new policy is changing the two policies that it's replacing? I can see one difference is it's adding credit recovery during the school day. Are there other major changes um, to the programs that the policy changes is addressing? Um, yes, we have staff will speak to Mr. Imbriali. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so this was done. Um, we're collapsing 60. I want to get these numbers right. 6601 and 6604, because those programs and when what we call those programs don't exist anymore. So the summer school program and the evening school programs are collapsed into our educational options programs. And those programs, most of which last full school years in terms of services to students. So our students can go in and out of programs as they need to earn credits, recover credits, or accelerate credits. So it's really about the new policy 6600 
is really about ensuring that our policy, the board's policy matches the programs we are offering and gives us the opportunity to expand options for students moving forward. So which of those doesn't exist anymore? So we now have extended year instead of summer school, but extended year extends beyond the summer school window. So a student has the ability to start a course during summer school, but then transition into our SPARK program, which is at each of our high schools, and, and they're able to obtain that credit through that process. Okay. Um, are these programs among those that were being cut to pay for STAT? N none of these, no, none of these programs, these are all, these options programs are expansions in terms of services to schools. So we're our, expanding, not reducing. That's correct. Okay. Uh, are there any, are there any other major changes that the board <coughs> needs to understand? No, it was truly about making sure that the language matched the work that we were doing in the system. Okay, all right, thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I reviewed these policies uh, and then also the uh, new superintendent's rule, uh, which comes along with it, I had a couple quick questions. Um, and I'll just ask them all at once and then um, whomever can respond to them. One is uh, there's no eligibility paragraph uh, similar into that was in uh, policy 6604. And also in the rule, there are not eligibility guidelines. It just states that <clears throat> the curriculum and instruction will determine eligibility, whereas before eligibility was in policy. So in terms of uh, students and parents understanding what they're eligible to receive, um, I'd like to know where that where those guidelines are gonna be for the parents and, and then also for the administration to know. The other issue is that uh, also in one of the other uh, policies that's being deleted, there is the paragraph that talks about transportation will be provided, but in the new policy 6600, there is no mention of transportation and it's not in the um, rule. And the third thing is, will classes still be available in the school buildings I'm just curious why there was no transportation mentioned um, so that these classes were, will still be traditional versions available. I know that we have e-learning available, but will there still be traditional classes in school buildings with teachers and with transportation provided? Yes, Mrs. Causey, we have a we have a whole range of options for for students. So our um, the Spark program that I spoke about uh, just a couple minutes ago, that program is available in all of our school buildings, and that's support directly with students working with the courses, either accelerating the accelerating credit that they need or um, going through a re remediation pro uh, process to ensure that they can recover credit that they might have missed. We're actually seeing a reduction in the number of students who participate in our summer programs um, around. Uh, recovering credit because we can provide these services directly in our high school buildings for students. That's wonderful. And then is the SPARK program only online or is that textbook and teacher um, the, available? The SPARK program is a blended program. So there's teachers, um, there are certified teachers who work with those students in those uh, rooms and then they're accessing content and information both online and through actual um, docu documented material that they have in their hands. Okay, and typically how many students, uh, what is the student teacher ratio for the SPARK program for those students? It depends school to, it depends the uh, school to school in terms of the number of students who are accessing credit, but there's typically, at, uh, it's typically in six of our programs where we used to have our advanced path program, there's at least four teachers in those, in those classrooms working with those students. But so it's not one teacher to 30 students, it's No, it depends on the needs of the students. So um, we're always looking at the courses that they're taking, the needs they might have, if there's a need to recover um, history credit versus mathematics credits versus science credits or social, you're always looking at what they need. So right now, what's the greatest student to teacher ratio that we have in the SPARK program? I would have to get, I would have to get you that information. Okay. No ballpark. Uh, no, I would have to get you that information. Okay. Um, and then transportation, is that still going to be uh, offered for uh, the, um, the uh, 
year-long option yes we still provide our transportation during summer programs okay and then how is the eligibility going uh, guidelines they're going to be developed according to the rule so how will they be made available to uh, parents so there are um, our guidelines and uh, if you want to call it eligibility but opportunities for students are on our website right now so a parent could go to our website find out uh, what information they would need to if they are interested in taking a course in our spark program or whatever it might be or you could contact the office of educational options directly and all that information is available okay because currently the the eligibility states that a current high school student who's attending a public high school and has a written permission of the principal of the student's home school um, is eligible for evening or saturday high school programs um, a student that is not currently attending high school and does not have a high school diploma um, also, a student who has completed the eighth grade and is taking courses to gain admission to college. So, are those are those those types of students still eligible? All to those take criteria classes? still stand. Yes. Okay, that's great. I just wanted to have that yes. clarified. Thank you. Any other questions on 6600, Ms. Johnson? I actually, don't have a question. I just want to thank um, our PRC chair, Ms. Williams, for your leadership on during our PRC meeting. And there are some things that I just kind of wanted to read because I know that sometimes the uh, the community doesn't have all of the, the, the paperwork that we do have in front of them. So these educational options were brought to light to the school board and to PRC and really expanded the options that we have. So some of them are, they offer original and recovery credit courses for students to meet graduation requirements. Check, we need more students to, to, uh, to graduate and further their, their education past graduation. Ensure that students with disabilities receive special education services as determined by the student's individual education program. Ensure students attending Title I schools receive ongoing learning opportunities and offer educational programs for academic acceleration. So this is a really excellent policy. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to thank um, Ms. Causey for bringing up the changes in the policy regarding eligibility and transportation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important uh, that we define that in policy. So I wanted to find out what the uh, members of the PRC were thinking about why that was removed and whether or not that's important to maintain in policy. If there's if there's no answer to that, I think perhaps I'm satisfied that it was addressed that transportation is being provided. I don't know about the other PRC members. Right. But Mr. Amorelli shared his his answers with us, so I'm yeah. satisfied as well. But it was actively removed from the policy, so there's probably a reason that it was removed from the policy, and it used to exist, and it probably existed for a reason. So uh, I have concerns about that. I, I'm thinking that, you want to address that it might be prudent for us to send this back to PRC and make that change. Mr. Mr. Embriotti. Thank you, Mr. Embriotti. It's all our standards. Sure, that's the uh, hi again. <laughs> the, the board is welcome to do whatever it, it uh, sees fit. Uh, the change in the, the policy is because the, the original programs that this spoke about had to have transportation in order for those programs to exist. So, so you're talking about programs that existed in a physical space that, that required a teacher in order to deliver all of that instruction, required transportation to get there. We've expanded our options. Um, and and the, the multitude of options that we now offer to students in very, in in different ways. So a student can have that experience face-to-face -face where transportation is necessary. They can have that experience online. They can have that experience in a blended approach. It, uh, that is why this policy is existing like it is in front of you all. Thank you. Mrs. Miller, do you want to make a motion to, to uh, remand this, to send it back to PRC? If not, we'll take a vote on the policy now before your motion. I, I do. Um, first, I wanted to have the eligibility issue addressed as well was there a reason why that was removed so do you want to do you want to make a motion to remand this and then any issue you want to can be discussed and we'll have a vote on seeing whether it's remanded 
Yes, I move to remand the policy back to PRC so that eligibility and other verbiage that was removed from the old policies can be replaced. Is there a second? The motion fails for lack of a second. Now, is there any further discussion on 6600? Mrs. Causey. Mr. Chair, I would just like to ask our uh, council, both uh, the uh, school council and the board council, to, uh, to clarify that in the policy where it says students, that that will define the eligibility, that there is something that is in the policy that does give uh, eligibility um, definition so that parents and students can know that they have these options available. Can I ask for that clarification? So you want to know if students means students of Baltimore County Public Schools? If it ties with the eligibility that was taken out. Yes. Uh, I think we can all agree that students means students of Baltimore County Public Schools. Okay. Are you saying that as an attorney or as the chair of the board well, in order for me to not, yeah. to not have counsel? Well, Just clarify and make everyone comfortable with it. Can I comment as sure. a lay person? Um, with the word students, you've got to take the word preceding it, like for students, uh, to meet graduation requirements. So that, to me, would indicate that all students who have to meet graduation requirements are hereby eligible for the program. In the second part, it says student, that students with disabilities receive. That, to me, means students who are deemed to have disability, uh, you know, we have to ensure that they will receive uh, the services. The last part, ensure students attending Title I schools okay. receive. Is I students mean, so a defined they, term a in the policy? To me, with, the, with the whole paragraph, instead of taking the word out of context, just they say Council says student is not a defined term in the policies. Therefore, we can agree that students means Baltimore County Public Schools students. Mr. Ufelder's remarks have uh, prompted me to have one last question that I could ask of staff. Uh, the policy reads, offer original and recovery credit courses for students to meet graduation requirements. Previously, students have been able to take original credit courses, not necessarily for graduated requ graduation requirements, but they are beyond graduation requirements. So will there still be the ability for students to take courses that will advance them in their educational career that are beyond the minimum graduation requirements? There you go. Yes. Okay. All right, any further discussion on 6600? Mrs. Miller. Yes, I'd like to go back to my question about why eligibility uh, definitions were removed. So eligible, we, we've expanded eligibility. I don't think your mic is on. So sit down at the desk, it's easier. <laughs> uh, we've expanded eligibility. So the original, uh, what was in the prior policy, specifically talked about eighth grade. Uh, we offer, as you can see, through Title I programs, through all of the various options, our programs are offered uh, for students as um, beginning as early as elementary school and expand certainly into our middle school grades. So it's really, an, uh, again, I want to reiterate, it's an expansion of services, and um, it's, a, it's, it's in a, the design of this policy is to ensure that we have multiple various approaches to meet our kids' needs. Now that the window is open, Washington can hear us. That's good. Okay, so if, if Speak loudly. there was eligibility in the old policies, why was it not redefined to show the expansion in the new policy? So, Ms. Miller, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding your, your question. No, sir. Table two. I'm on to the, oh, okay. there you got it. I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question because before we had a policy for summer school, there were eligibility requirements for summer school. We had eligibility requirements for, um, for extended day learning programs, right? So are you asking for eligibility for extended day, for extended year, for, um, I'm trying to get underneath your question I, because for each of those, it, there are eligibility requirements. So to put all of that information in policy 
um, would probably run counter to governance. All right, are there any other questions about 6600? Uh, I'm not sure it would run counter to governance, but I could see it, it would, it's more complex. Um, and that's not in the, um, the rule that's associated, correct? So it's just undefined at this point. All right. I think we've had good discussion. Is, uh, is the board ready for a vote on 6600? Yes. And I think I will uh, uh, assume that 6600, the amendment, as well as the deletion of 6601 and 6604 can be handled as a group. So all in favor of amending 6600 and deleting 6601 and 6604, please say aye. 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 Opposed? This is Miller. The um, um, amendments and deletions as recommended by PRC uh, are adopted. Thank you, um, Mrs. Williams. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item J, unfinished business, the proposed 2018 operating budget. The superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2018 operating budget was introduced to the board on January 10. A public hearing was held on January 17. The public provided the board with many valuable comments and perspectives. The board then held public budget work sessions on January 24 and 31. Uh, as Dr. Dance stated, over 130 written questions were submitted by board members, which were answered in writing by staff and posted on both the website and included in board docs. Additional questions have been submitted uh, since that January 31 date, and the staff is prepared to address those now. Uh, this has been a most comprehensive budget uh, submission by the superintendent and provides the necessary components for the Baltimore County Public Schools to continue the work as outlined in Blueprint 2.0. Uh, on the board's behalf, I, I thank Dr. Dance and his staff for their work uh, on this budget and for their time and effort in answering the board's uh, uh, many important questions. As we move forward to vote on the budget, let us keep in mind that uh, the county, our funding source, requires our input uh, at this time. Uh, so I invite Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tantliff uh, uh, to address the issues that have been submitted to you. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Uh, I, I think I can't say it any better than what Mr. Gillis said. We have had uh, a robust discussion related to the budget. We are here today to seek your approval for the FY18 um, proposed budget. Uh, operating budget. There were a host of questions that were asked and answered before, and there were a few follow-up questions that we have that we're going to respond to here on the, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantler. After that time, we will respond to any questions you may have, and we seek your support for approval of the FY 2018 operating budget. Very good. Okay, uh, just to preface, the, the format that you have tonight is uh, a summary of all funds, revenues, and expenditures, as well as a detailed snapshot of all general fund revenue. And uh, I will uh, let Mr. Tantliff address some of the additional uh, questions that we can uh, clarify for, for you. Yeah. Um, uh, Ms. Causey submitted another set of questions. Uh, there were four questions, uh, and the first one asked about what's in the 7.3 million in instructional textbooks and supplies. Uh, there were 6.2 million in one-time requests, 900,000 in ongoing textbook funds, and $205,000 in ongoing instructional supplies and staff developmental supplies, development supplies. Um, there was a question about iReady. Uh, you had asked about the $720,000 that we mentioned were in the um, FY17 budget or a, as a purchase order in the current fiscal year uh, versus the 223000 The difference is 
um, the 720,000 was approved in the FY17 budget, so it's for this year's expenditures. The 223,000 is, is a new additional expenditure in FY18. Okay. For uh, grades four and five expansion. Yeah. Uh, the next question uh, was, uh, it reads, there was 41.2 million in the fiscal 18 budget slated for daily and one-to-one -one devices. The remainder of the 53.6 million for FY18 or 12.4 million would then be related to software license fees. Correct? Question mark. Um, and the answer is no, that's not correct. Uh, because the question was just referring to the increase in costs, not the co composition of that entire budget. So we were only talking about how much it has increased over the time period. That was the first question addressed versus the, the total budget, which um, you know had dollars in there to begin with before STAT came online. Um, so I'll, I'll just list the, the top items, and we can give you uh, the full list later on. But there's 41.5 million for STAT one-to-one -one devices. 4.9 million in software license fees, 1.8 million in copier and printing charges, uh, a little over a million in professional development. There were 722,000 for uh, athletic event referees, uh, college and career readiness, 670,000, math, 620,000, uh, instructional contracted services, 589, um, and then uh, about 10 other items that were uh, of decreasing value. Um, next question, um, please detail the vendors and products being funded in digital learning under instructional textbooks and supplies, 2.1 million. 1.6 million is for digital textbooks and contents. Vendors such as Safari Montage and Discovery have existing board approved contracts with BCPS. Other vendors are required to bid for contracts. BCPS is a member of the MDK-12 Digital Library, a consortium of Maryland LEAs that leverages collective buying power to negotiate statewide pricing for uh, authoritative digital content. Price for content is offered using a variety of formulas. <clears throat> um, 506,000 used for physical library books. Vendors with existing board approved contracts, the BCPS may be used to purchase the library books. Other vendors may be required to bid. Uh, next part of the question, uh, please detail which vendors and or services fall under other instructional costs, $1.3 million. Um, it's used for software license fees for programs such as Destiny Resource Manager, Library Manager, State Standards, Soft Chalk, Blackboard, Web Conferencing, WebPath Express. The remaining funds are used for equipment, travel and conference fees, professional dues, and miscellaneous um, contract services. Last part of the question, are these numbers singularly cited here, only in the budget or elsewhere? Uh, all departmental budgets are included in the summary division roll-up at the beginning of each tab. The department budgets are also uh, included in the BCPS roll-up reports on pages, uh, well, on a variety of pages. Um, I think the last uh, part of the question is where are the costs for Middlebury <coughs> in the FY18 budget? Please cite the page number, et cetera. Um, there are no additional requests for Middlebury in the FY18 budget. However, there is uh, just about $60,000 for Middlebury located on page 247 in the Office of World Languages. So that's um, an e existing budget that will carry forward. Uh, and then you had a couple of yes, no answers. English language arts, instructional tools, and supplemental resources for grades one through three and six through nine, 121,000, and pilot for grades four and five. Is this I ready? Yes. Um, last question, tech book, digital resources to support the state mandated next gen science curricula in grades six through eight and nine through 12, engaging students in science and engineering concepts, 536,000. Is this discovery education textbooks? The answer is yes. And that uh, concludes the questions that you submitted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Is there any other, uh, Mrs. Causey? If I could just follow up on one of the questions um, that was asked 
two weeks ago and there was an answer given, but it's, uh, it's not clear. Um, and it was asked, uh, when the county executive uh, issued a press release on May 18, 2016, the, count, the county um, executive discussed $20 million in surplus funds that the superintendent would transfer back to the county to support central air conditioning projects. And I asked the question, where did those surplus funds come from? And they, uh, there was a discussion of the county historically manages the use of fund balance as a source of current revenue in order to help maintain the lowest possible taxes and fees. And these amounts totaled $15.2 million in fiscal year 2014, $13.1 million in fiscal year 2015, $19.2, $23.2 in fiscal year 2017. And the proposed fiscal year 2018 budget includes $27.7 million of appropriated fund balance. But it doesn't say where did those funds come from. The, the, the follow-up question that I asked, and again, that's, that was... Um, vaguely answered, not completely answered, is if they were unfilled employee positions, please outline which ones by budget area. Because we have uh, heard here tonight concerns about parents with staff not being sufficient in schools. We have uh, go through um, our reports where we have teachers that are um, resigning or retiring and where we have uh, many, many long-term substitutes. So. It's important for us as a board to understand when we have all of these needs in our community, where are the unfilled positions? Where is this money coming from? Because we're going to vote on a budget tonight because the board and, and the superintendent and the administration have worked diligently to come up with amounts. And yet there's these very uh, large differences that come about, and especially in this past year with the 20 million, where we don't know where that came from. Where was the overage in the projection or where was something not followed through on in terms of staffing in our schools um, to help our students achieve and to help the teachers teach. So I would like a little more clarity around how that 20 million from last year came about. Uh, well, Ms. Causey, what I would say in general uh, is the net of our revenue and expenses, whatever that positive balance is at the end of the year is called fund balance. To use those funds, we need to get permission from the county and we keep track of that balance in our CAFR. Um, and in this case, working with the county and the board, we requested to use $20 million of that fund out of our normal budget cycle, but approved by the board here and the um, county council to uh, use those funds from fund balance in the same way that we appropriate fund balance in the several operating uh, budgets that you cited just earlier. So Most are you talking the, about the official budget allocation transfers? Is that what you're talking about, the official no, budget allocation I'm transfers? Okay. Let, me clear, let me expand on what Mr. Tantliff has said. Um, we have approximately 15,000 full-time FTEs in the budget, and at any given time, there are probably 300 average vacancies. That's two-tenths of a percent of the entire staffing budget. And uh, of those 300, maybe a third are teachers, and it's a rolling number that changes from month to month. So even though teachers, uh, comprise well over half of our total FTEs, their vacancy, the percentage of vacancies is actually less than average. Um, and the biggest single um, source of surplus funds is not these this two-tenths of a percent of vacancies. Uh, it is really the turnover from retirements and, uh, you know, every, I think we may have hired close to 1,000 staff this year. And when you're replacing that many positions, often primarily due to retirements, people at the highest end of the pay scale with people at the introductory level, that is where the majority of those funds come from. Mr. Yulfelder. Can I give you a layman's answer to that? If we were to take the number of positions and multiply it times the actual salary and cost, 
our budget would be higher than $1.6 billion. The way the budget is put together is that there is a natural turnover. And so the turnover creates a gap in what a full-time person would have been paid had they stayed to the end of the budget year, as opposed to actually that they have retired, died, whatever the case may be, and therefore that gap uh, creates a budget. $20 million on a $1.6 billion budget is, a, is about 1.12 percent, uh, if I do it real fast. So it's not hard to, to, to understand that probably, uh, I understand about 82 percent or so of our total budget is related to personnel. And so if an individual retires prematurely or quits or dies or whatever, the, the budget took that into consideration when it was put together. Otherwise, if you had to take every single individual starting, every employee, and multiply out their actual salary and their benefits, the budget, the budget request would be probably $2 billion or somewhere in that area. Yeah, on that point, I, I thank you because it. that's another aspect of this budget is that uh, after we calculate all the salaries for all the authorized positions, uh, we, uh, we work with county government and we assume right. the turnover vacancy and we take $25 billion right off the top. So we're not, you know, we do this because we recognize that there is an actual Okay, we'll vacancy. make one more stab at fund balance, and it's Mr. Tantlis' answer, I think, that you want to hear, and that is there is an allocation of monies at the beginning of the year, and then there are monies that are spent. The difference at the end of the year is the fund balance, and it can come from any one of the lines, including salaries, in the budget. And, it act, and as a matter of fact, I'm certain that it comes from most of the lines in the budget. Um, and that fund balance is what is allocated with the county's permission the following year. Now, are there any other questions about uh, those questions that Mrs. Causey asked? If not, I'm going to ask for a motion uh, to, as I told you all in, um, in advance, uh, ask for a motion to adopt um, Exhibit J1, which is the uh, three-page budget in front of you, and then uh, after it's m moved and second, I understand that there are people that want to make motions to amend. Um, is there a motion to accept or adopt J1? So moved. Second. All right. So there's a motion and a second to uh, adopt the, the budget as presented uh, by uh, Mr. Saris. Now, uh, discussion. Mrs. Miller. Yes. Um, I have one primary issue with the budget, but it affects every aspect of the budget, and that is the expenditure for STAT, um, which I've talked about since I came on the board. Um, so I'm just going to make a motion to amend and then um, give my discussion after that. So I move to amend the motion to require a one-year freeze on further expansion of STAT until it can be thoroughly evaluated for success and justified. Um, right, is there a second on Ms. M Mrs. Miller's motion to amend to require a one-year freeze on STAT? I'll second it for discussion purposes. All right, there's a motion now and a second, and we'll have a discussion on the motion to amend. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're now more than halfway through our third year of implementation of STAT. But we still, although we've been requesting it, we still have um, no quantifiable evidence that's been produced that shows that this, this most expensive program in BCPS history is actually benefiting student outcomes. Now, we're more than a quarter billion dollars in, plus annual costs of 60 million or more going forward. Um, so as far as evidence of success or not, um, due to a rollout which has had no pilots and really no planned way of being evaluated for student success, uh, the only measures we can look at are actually showing evidence that STAT is hurting our students, teachers, and our school system. 
For instance, park scores have dropped, map scores are below the average in our state, teachers are overwhelmed and leaving the system. Um, we've had thousands of public input emails and testimony, um, and through that we know that our school system is suffering in almost every department. Our superintendent made cuts to over 300 system programs in order to pay for STAT, um, but he has, uh, does not seem to want to release that information to the board. Um, this is the most valuable information that has been asked in the budget process, which is what is the opportunity cost of STAT? I don't believe that STAT is sustainable over time. Um, I don't think uh, we can consider it to be sustainable even right now if we consider that opportunity cost and the negative impact it's having. Curriculum, transportation, special ed, teacher shortages, magnet programs, school level budgets, grounds and building maintenance, athletic budgets, reduction of assistant principals, elimination of the block schedule, elimination of tech teachers, reduction of GT classes in elementary schools, closure of elementary schools, self-contained classroom program for special ed, accessing of paraeducators, overuse of long-term subs, delays in hiring for unfilled positions, and that is just a portion because, again, that goes on for 300 programs. This board has a legal and moral obligation to provide oversight and direction of our superintendent and school system. At every step of the way, we have the ability to change direction Let's have a reason for moving forward, forward with STAT before we plow forward blindly at the expense of students who have just one shot to get a proper education. We owe it to them, the taxpayers, our teachers, the school system, and to those who will come after us picking up the pieces from what we leave behind. All right, uh, I'm gonna call for a vote now on Mrs. Mrs. Causey, do you have comment on the, the motion to amend? Yes, yes I do. Uh, so I agree with um, everything that a uh, fellow board member uh, Ms. Miller has stated in terms of STAT, what we have heard um, from the community, throughout the community, um, as she mentioned, in all of these concerns. There's also the seven period day uh, schools Delaney, Towson, uh, Parkville, and others that lost their schedule, which increased uh, teacher workload at each and every one of those schools, decreased instruction time as the students tried to, and the teachers tried to fit seven, uh, eight classes into the same minutes in which they had seven minutes in the, in the prior years. Uh, also, I would just like to make a statement about the uh, stat, and this is from the biannual, biannual conversions update, June, 2016. Is that available on the website, Dr. Dance? Pretty sure it is. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, for reading from page eight, and it talks about the summary it goes through. As we conclude year three, the eight conversions are progressing toward the goal of systemic institu institutionalization by the year 2018. And what's going to happen in next year's budget cycle, if there's not any uh, changes that are made, is we uh, the plan is to have 21 additional high schools come online with the digital devices uh, that are 1,500 or whatever they're going to be, depending on the lease uh, interest rates at that point, um, for four years. Uh, so all four grades in 21 high schools signing up for leases uh, for, th for these uh, devices for four years, which we've been told by our fiscal uh, staff, they are obligatory. Uh, so this is the time to do a complete evaluation of what is working for our students, what is not working for our students, and to really um, understand how to have reasonable expenditures on technology because it is important for our students to be able to, and our teachers to be able to leverage technology, but we need to do it in a way where we're not taking money away from other very important and even safety-oriented uh, programs for our students. So I would just have to um, agree with my fellow board member. Mr. Chairman, 
Mr. Virch. Thank you very much. I note that uh, we have approximately 400 devices uh, in the hands of students at Hereford Middle School. There's a thousand students there. So uh, I also look at Hereford High School. There's 120 devices in Hereford High School, but there's 1,249 students there. So where I'm going with this is, if you're a Hereford Middle School student and people you pass in the hallway have a laptop and you're thinking you're gonna be getting a laptop, or if you're a Hereford Middle School parent and you thought laptops could be coming to your children, there are board members on this board tonight, or at least a board member, who doesn't want your child to have a laptop. And that same thing applies for Hereford High School. Would freeze and keep high school students who are the closest students to entering the job market or going on to a higher academic institution or going into the defense of our country by serving in the military to not have access to this technology. Now that's just out there in Hereford. But I'm here to tell you, in the area that I represent, where there are students who have hands that look like mine, where there are brown students, where there are uh, yellow students, where there are black students, who've been promised these laptops. Their families can't just go out and buy them. P in public stands for exactly that, public. It's for everyone to have. And as you look around the attachment that's been, that's been given to us, um, with this uh, memo from the superintendent, there's a pretty fair distribution of devices around this, this county, regardless of one's economic background or what may be one's demographics and what their family may be. Uh, it's a remarkable program. There are folks who want to stop it in its tracks, and I don't think we help education by taking laptops out of the hands of our students, whether they look like me or they don't. I think this is ill-advised. This is someone attempting to stop progress in our school system completely. Think of the pandemonium, the bedlam that results. There's a duty we owe to our families to proceed with the orderly business of education. I will oppose this motion. There are um, uh, hands by Mrs. Miller and Ms. Cause who have both spoken, uh, and I'm going to allow both of you to speak again, but briefly, um, so that we can have a vote on uh, this motion to amend. I'd just like to respond to his Mrs. comment. Mrs. Miller, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, apparently, Mr. Virch has not been listening to the public comment because, as Ms. Freeman of the Central Area Advisory Group has stated, and she represents the whole central area of our county, we don't have the public coming up and asking us for devices. What they're asking for is the basic needs of our school system to be met. And that is the opportunity cost of STAT. So we need to start listening to the public. They're asking for teachers. They're asking for special ed. They're asking for transportation problems to be resolved. They are not asking for devices. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mrs. Causey. And I would just like to respond by saying that in no point did I ever say that I do not want the high schoolers to have laptops, but rather that we need to evaluate <coughs> where the programs are, where they're working, how much money this is actually costing. One of the things that I would propose is that we start a search for a lesser price device for our elementary students and move those higher priced laptops for which we're already obligated for leases up to the high school students. The uh, gentleman from the uh, HP, the vice president of global sales, who uh, was one of the uh, team that helped uh, us purchase all of those HP devices has now been promoting the last year the uh, Chromebooks that are available starting at $199. And as anyone who, <laughs> Anyone who watches technology or has been involved in technology understands that as time goes by, technology in, includes more features at a lower price as time goes by. So to, for us to be tied for four years to the same technology is, is fiscally negligent. And we can uh, provide, we can look for what is financially sustainable, what's technically and appropriate for our children, and do it the right way. So if we could 
entertain that as part of what we're uh, looking at the whole program and deciding what can work and what doesn't work, that's something that I would propose that staff and the board work together on, is identifying where have advances been made in technology where we can provide what our students need, but at a lower cost, and provide, because kindergartners don't have the same needs as the high school students, you, which Spazzi. I am very well aware of. Mr. Yulfader, you have the last word on this motion to amend. There are a number of things that I'd like to say. Number one, one of the things that I dislike the most, there are misstatements. Um, it seems to me that, Ms. Miller, all the things you cited that are negative, we must be doing something right. Our graduation rate is going up. What are we doing correctly? When we initiate... Those students don't have the devices when we in Please, Mrs. Causey, he has the floor. <laughs> but the, but the, ones who are, the ones who are to graduate, which hopefully will continue to give the rise in graduation rate, will have uh, devices. I don't know where you people are. We are now in the digital age. Let's define the digital age. When we initiated this program, and I was very much in favor of it, and by the way, I, I would ask you to go back and look at the cost and see all that's included in the cost. It's more than a device. So the device is not costing us, quoting you, $1,300, much less. But it includes a lot of other things, updates and everything else, technology as it moves ahead, we are the beneficiaries of that in our pricing, in our leasing costs. Um, we're in a digital age now. I mean, if you would go into the schools and you see the, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade kids, they are rolling with this thing like, like you've never seen before. This is a part of education. And I don't know, and it was, it was said that the results of what we're doing cannot be ascertained in the year, two years, or three years. It comes in down the road. We, have, we are creating the platform, the base for the future. Now, if you believe that we ought to stop and go back, and you know, there's an ad on television that says, if you don't invest now, you're going to pay twice as much later. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Our program happens to be uh, one of the most progressive programs in the country. And I might say Perry Hall is a capital item, so it not, has nothing to do with the uh, operational budget. Ready? Ready? But um, yeah, and, and you got to remember where the money comes from. It, co it comes from the county. We have no uh, claim on if we got everything we wanted, it'd be something else. But in any event, we're in a digital age, and our kids at every level have to be part of the digital age. And to, to abruptly stop this program is, is really borders on ridiculous. And to say that we can ascertain today the value of this program is also a very difficult task. It will take several years. We are on the right path. And I think that our kids are benefiting greatly from what we are doing. Very good. Thank you. Um, I remind everyone that uh, Ms. Bratt does not vote on, um, on this budget issue. So everything that we go forward needs uh, at least six votes. All in favor of? May I uh, restate the motion? Uh, no. Uh, the motion to amend as from Ms. Miller is to require a one-year freeze on STAT. Yes, uh, it, I, I, it just sounded like some of the board members did not that's, understand that's, that. That's, that's it. Um, so that's the motion uh, that's on the floor. All in favor of the motion to amend, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, the motion to amend fails. Uh, there were two votes, Mrs. D Mrs. Decker, uh, Ms. Causey, and Ms. Miller. Uh, Mr. Stewart, you had your hand up. I did. Um, I'll make a motion and then hopefully offer a little discussion. I move that a new position, Coordinator of Workforce Development, Division of Curriculum and Instruction, be added to the FY 2018 operating budget request. Is there a second of uh, uh, Mr. Stewart's motion to add a Coordinator of Workforce Development? I'll second. second. A motion and a second. Now, Mr. Stewart. So, board members, I generally try to reserve comments for those issues with critical importance that sometimes get overlooked. Um, and issues that may need an advocate. Uh, you have before you what I believe to be one of those issues. This motion would add a full-time employee to serve within the division as a, quote, coordinator of workforce development. The reasons for the motion and the roles and responsibilities of this coordinator position are set forth more fully in the motion which you have before you. And I request that it be added to board docs in its entirety as the official version. But I'll just give a little brief background rather than reading the full length of this. 
Uh, I firmly believe that one of the central purposes of our system is to build family sustaining, personally fulfilling careers and to empower our kids to reach that level. I've had a chance to work on this issue as a member of the county's workforce development board since 2014 and now as a school board member. After doing a deep dive on our budget, exchanging questions and answers, which you have seen, and having several conversations with the administration, it's clear that we're doing quite a lot in order to prepare our kids for college and career. However, there remains an opportunity for us to better coordinate our efforts, not only internally, but also externally with our state and county partners. Indeed, folks, we have seven different offices that are involved with or touch on our efforts for college and career readiness. They're listed in the motion, Office of Career uh, and Technology Education, Office of College and Career Readiness, Magnet Programs, Advanced Academics, Educational Options, School Counseling, Special Education, and so on. But we don't have a central point of contact for all these efforts, someone internally and externally who's looking across the entire horizon for our efforts and ensuring that we're moving forward in the most effective and efficient way that we can, someone who's not siloed. And that's why this motion is before you, and that's why I urge that you approve it. Further discussion, Mrs. Miller. Yeah, I'm, I'm not understanding. This seems very unusual to me because you're not proposing a board you know, staff, correct? This is a central office staff member. This is a position that would fall under the division of curriculum and instruction. So it's why would member. why would it be appropriate for the board to move for a staff position to be created in the central office when that would normally be something that the superintendent would do? Well, two things. One, without the funding, the position is not going to exist, period. And then two, this is not something that is entirely out of the blue. As I said, I've been coordinating with the administration on this issue and whether this might be something that would be a value add. All right, other why would comments that or not questions? Be, why would that not have been proposed by the superintendent? Why does the board need to propose this? Ms. Miller, it's before the board because this position requires funding. So it's an operating budget request to fund such a position. Mrs. Causey. Um, first, I would like to say thank you for taking the time to work on this issue. Um, there are uh, efforts throughout the county and also at the state level in terms of making sure that our um, public education will provide um, the employees necessary, whether it's through VOTEC, whether it's right out of graduation, or whether it's after college, uh, to help the economic engine of uh, the state of Maryland. Not only for, as you had mentioned, for individual citizens and families to be independent, um, but also as a state to help grow communities and to grow the state. Um, so I can see where this position would be helpful um, within the school system. Uh, one question I had is, are you asking to offset some other area in the budget, or you're asking this to be an addition FTE to the budget? So the, the purpose of this is to be an additional FTE. Roles and responsibilities are described herein, but are, this is acknowledgement that they might need to be changed as they practically are implemented along the way. Any other discussion on? Mr. Yule. Yeah, I, I'd like to support this. Uh, I served on workforce development for many years and chaired it back in 2004 and 5. Um, one of the areas that uh, where education is going uh, is career and technology. And um, surprising, uh, we have many, many kids in that program who go on to colleges, uh, irrespective of what they've learned in, in the high school. And, and I believe that perhaps a, a, a coordinator of all these various uh, offices uh, would be very helpful to the superintendent and his staff in, in the various uh, areas. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nick, thanks for the very thoughtful motion. Um, I also appreciate your very straight answers and the fact that you believe in the concept such that you don't believe something should be taken from anywhere else. It should stand on its own merits. I'm persuaded it stands on its own merits. I'll support the motion. Any other discussion before we call this yes. a motion to amend on a vote? 
Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, you truncated my line of questioning earlier, and it really just wastes time when you do that. Well, Mrs. Miller, it, 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 there are a lot of people here, and just because you get the floor doesn't mean you get the floor for all, for all time. I, I'm so not I'm a trying big to make talker, certain. So I'm Mr. trying Hillis. to make certain, Mrs. Miller, that everyone has an opportunity to talk. Well, I wish you would uh, equitably, right, please, please if you would equitably uh, um, enforce proceed. that, I'd appreciate it. Um, so, um, Mr. Stewart, you serve on the, um, what is the name of the committee? Workforce the Workforce Committee under the County Executive, Workforce is that Development right? Board. Okay, so Correct. I'm assuming this came out of work you were doing with that board? No, it's certainly informed by it, but it came out of work that I do as a school board member. Okay, so that wasn't a request from the, <coughs> that board or from the no, County Executive? No, it wasn't. Okay, so is the superintendent asking for this position to be created? I'm not sure why it wasn't put into the budget as, as a request from the superintendent. Ms. Miller, I'm, 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 I'm actually sensing the same responsibility that you do regularly, which is to try to oversee the governance of the system and make improvements. And, right, and this I, is one of them where I've worked with the administration on this as potentially something that not necessarily is overlooked, but represents an opportunity for us. And that's what I've done here, or what we have done together. No, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to understand the impetus for this, because it seems very unusual to me to have the board um, proposing central new central office staff. So when you say you worked with the administration, do you mean the superintendent? Do you mean the county executive's office? I, I don't mean the county executive's office or his staff. I mean this administration, in the school administration. So the superintendent is actually asking for this as well. This is my motion. This is not the superintendent's motion. Superintendent Mr. Miller, do you have any further comments on this? Yes, I, I'm making them. Does the superintendent want this position created? I work for the board. Right. Correct. I What's that? The, I work for the board. So to put it in less than 30 seconds, the budget process is I propose a budget. You guys can do whatever you want to, but I have to then have a budget to defend to the county executive for inclusion in the county budget. So you can add or delete anything from my budget to make it your budget. Right. Many right. board members had motions they wanted to consider where they asked the administration for feedback on that motion they wanted to make, and we provided that to several board members. Are you finding this to be a valuable addition? I'm trying to understand. Then I think you have to talk to your board member. Well, I'm asking if you I've support this. My budget, Ms. Miller. So you're not supporting this, is what you're saying? No, he doesn't. This is a I mean, this, this is a board is, issue. This is your central office staff. So that's not being supported by the right. superintendent. We're just wanting to add a central office. Any other staff. any other comments? But we haven't been able to fill a position that the board approved last year for a board staff member, but we want to add in. A, super, a uh, central office staff member. Mrs. Causey. Um, Mr. Stewart, and, and I might want um, Dr. Mayo to um, respond to this also. There are certain levels of um, central office personnel that the board needs to vote on, similar to how we voted on the community superintendent. Um, so is this senior executive director uh, or this coordinator of workforce development is that typically an, um, uh, an employee that the board votes on in terms of hiring or a reorganization? For hiring purposes, yes. So we would need to be involved in approving the hiring of this position? Yes, position, yes. Okay, and then, uh, Mr. Stewart, when you say these roles and responsibilities may be changed at the, discre at the discretion of the administration, would any changes in the roles and responsibilities have to be approved by the Board of Education? Um, fair question. That's not my intent in the motion. My intent is that this integration, once it's approved or if it's approved, would uh, would acknowledge that this uh, this administration is charged with actually administering the system itself, and that this is a role that is positioned within there, as opposed to one in which we're kind of overseeing directly. Okay, because I guess I'm I'm thinking if the if the board does vote to add this particular uh, position that it should stay that position unless it's approved to be changed by the board. That's my only, um, that would, that's my only suggestion about the proposal. All right, I think this, this uh, motion to amend is ready for a vote as well. Uh, all in favor of the motion to amend offered by Mr. Stewart to add a coordinator of workforce development, please raise your hands. 
it passes um, with 10 votes. And, uh, and I see Ms. Johnson has a, a motion. Yes, I do. Thank you. After extensive uh, discussion at the work session, today I move that we add 10 additional social workers to the fiscal year 18 budget for, the, for middle school support and two additional social workers at high, the high school level with the highest, uh, two high schools with the highest ESOL population. With the expectation that the superintendent will add additional social workers over the next two fiscal years in his proposed request to ensure all middle schools have a full-time social worker. My motion has an estimated fiscal, fiscal impact of 853,000 with 12 social workers. The cost factors in uh, the benefits for these 12 employees. So there's a motion to add 10 social workers at the middle school level and Second. two social workers at the high school level. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion, Mrs. Eaton. Uh, last week and just now with Ms. Johnson, we discussed to add more school counselors, social workers, and pupil personnel workers. After reading Dr. Lauren Taylor Mitchell's article that stressed this need, I too would like to advocate for more counselors social workers, and PPWs. I would like to see Baltimore County Public School guidelines meet the guidelines of the American Social Counselors Association. Our students deserve to have a ratio of one counselor and one social worker for every 250 students. We are always talking about the needs of our students, and we are here for our students. Well, we must take care of our students' basic needs before we can begin to educate them. Students can't concentrate if they come to school hungry or attend school without adequate supplies. And they can't concentrate if they are experiencing family drama of any kind. Our stakeholders today have spoken elaborately about the need for more support in our schools. They gave firsthand accounts about the terrible situation in two schools. We need to address these situations now. We need to look at our future budgets and make cuts where possible or put a freeze on certain areas. If making these small adjustments can improve the lives of our students, then we must look to make more minor adjustments in the future. I would like to see a pre-budget work session to address needs before we have to vote on a final budget and maybe it would alleviate these motions on the day that we have to vote for the budget. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with you, Ms. Eaton, completely. Um, I read the research myself, and I had done some of my own research um, with the administration and the different schools independently. Um, the role of the social worker is essential in ensuring that a strong home school partnership exists. As we discussed at the last meetings, there is a need for additional budget um, for a variety of the supports positions, the counselors, PPWs, and social workers, in addition to nurses and, and other supports positions like that. A few of the many services that social workers provide is academic support, social emotional behavior support, and community outreach. Additionally, social workers offer resource development for things like mental health care, early childhood education intervention, and housing assistance. With the increase in the needs of some of our students and parents, there is, a, there is a need for additional social workers and, again, and counselors. My motion is specifically speaks to the social workers at this point for three reasons. And I mentioned them last week, but I'm going to just reiterate them for, for the board to, to hear once again. I want to make sure that my motion can pass the board as a whole. Uh, my motion will be approved by the county and the county council, and it's feasible for the school, to, the school system to implement. My goal would to ultimately get to those ratios as well, but to try and find X amount of counselors and social workers and PPWs in one foul swoop, swoop um, I think would prove difficult to the school system. I do want to also thank uh, the county executive and county council for passing funding in the past to allow us to get to 73 full-time social workers, including um, one at each high school. So my goal, as, and I, as I said in the motion, is to has an expectation that the superintendent will continue to add social workers um, in his future budgets, which will decrease the amount of uh, social worker to student ratio. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. I want to thank Ms. Johnson for her motion um, and uh, thank Ms. Eaton for her comments. We have heard continually that our students need more support. When we're hearing from this school tonight about bullying, about fighting, we know that they can be helped by additional social worker help. 
Um, additionally, I'm going to um, amend um, Ms. Johnson's motion, um, and I want to move that the proposed fiscal year 2018 budget and her motion be amended and funding for the following staffing formulas regarding hiring 23 guidance counselors this year and then evaluating each year how many more we can put in place until we do come into line with uh, the uh, national standard ratios. The um, cost estimate for this request is $1.4 million per year for 23 positions. Uh, that was based on a salary of 47,000 plus 30% for the benefits and so on. Uh, it, this was requ uh, this <coughs> request, excuse me, was emailed to staff to respond to. So uh, hopefully we're in line. Um, also, I just want to point to discussion that we had earlier in terms of how large this budget is, and that adding this amount is not that much. It's not that much to ask for counselors to be available to help students in schools that are having trials and tribulations that either are create them to be bullies or they become victims of bullies. Also, these guidance counselors at the middle and high school level help our students start on the path of being career or college ready. So it's also very important for the many, many roles that they, that they take place. Additionally, for every student support that we can offer the students in the school, that will take work off of the teachers who know the kids, want to help the kids, they love those kids, and they will do what it takes. And if we can provide these additional supports, it will help every aspect of the uh, academic out outcomes for our students. Mrs. Gauzy, is your intention to seek to amend the motion to amend? Yes. All right, so we And need, I handed out hold, a, hold on, the hold brief on. We need, a, we need a second to the second. motion to amend. Was there a second? Yes. All right, so is there discussion on the 23 guidance counselor amendment. Mrs. Williams. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I completely support um, adding more um, counselors and more um, social workers. I would just caution my fellow board members from grouping them, to, grouping them together for the reason that if, if it's viewed as being asking for too much, then we might not get anything. So if we just do the motion separately, then I think they would have a better chance of surviving. Mr. McDaniels. Um, I uh, agree with Ms. Causey. I think we've heard that, and we've recognized that our students are coming to our schools with more uh, social and emotional uh, needs and resources. Uh, but personally, after looking into this, I look at the role of social workers and PPWs and counselors separately, and I would prefer um, voting on them independently. I don't, I don't look at them um, the same way. And um, for me, it would be helpful to, to vote on them independently. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Miller and then Mrs. Johnson. Yes, thank you for both of your motions. Um, I wanted to ask both of you. Uh, Hold on, this is, the, this is the motion to amend the motion to amend. So the discussion is on 23 guidance counselors. I understand, but they are related. No, they're not related. Well, they're related in my mind. So like, I just want to make sure that we understand what we're asking for here. Um, I, and was it considered that, I mean, at this point, we're asking for an increase in the budget unless we specify that the money should be taken from somewhere else. So would it be helpful to actually specify a reduction in some other area in order to increase the chance that this will that's be accepted? Neat. That's, that's not part of the motion to amend, uh, the motion to it amend. It is, because that it, could it, be. It is not. The discussion is 23 guidance counselors. And, I need some clarity. Um, and so we can have that discussion I'm asking, later. I'm asking if they considered that. All right. Any other? Mrs. Johnson. Can uh, I get an answer to the question? Mine is not to take away from, mine is an addition to the budget. Thank you. Do you Dr. Think Mayo, can I ask you a question? Um, is it feasible to have, um, to find 20, I think it's a great, I, I agree. It, um, is it feasible to find and really, I mean, the funding will come from where the funding comes from, but is it feasible to find 23 counselors? We have a lot of teachers who are currently in council programs right now. Mr. Um, I, I'm not sure 
I understand. Are you are you're suggesting 23 positions per year for the next five years? That's what's written here. Now, you didn't exactly say a definitive amount going forward, so I just want to be clear is what you're, what, what are you asking? The goal would be to move forward with that, but we're voting on this year's budget. So the only thing that I can actually make a motion about is this year's budget 20, of 23, 23. Okay. additional guidance counselors. And I handed each of you my motion on paper, and you'll notice <coughs> that it says the proposal is starting in the schools with the highest farm ratio and the lowest counselor per student ratio so that we can help our neediest students first. Mr. Yulpeter? Well, again, is, or is the highest farm ratio and the lowest counselor per student the same school? Or will you have schools where you have high um, farm ratios and other schools with uh, very low counselor ratios? So is, it this, is that criteria for a school, both, both parts of it? Yes, and okay. I would, I would right, I just, I trust understand. staff to be able to identify the schools that are have the most vulnerable populations and could use those guidance counselors okay. first. The motion on the floor is to. I'd like to, I'd like to say that I, I think we ought to bifurcate the motion. Okay. So and it, vote on each one separately. All right. So, but we now now have a motion on the floor to amend the motion, and the motion to amend is to add. 23 guidance counselors to the motion to amend that has not yet been voted on to add 10 social workers. So the motion to amend 12 social workers, 10 social workers in middle school and two in two high school. Right. So the, the motion is now on the floor is to amend the motion to amend. All in favor, please say aye. Um, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Uh, the motion to amend fails, so we're back to the Johnson motion to amend, which is 10 social workers and two, uh, 10 social workers in middle school and two social workers in high school. Any further discussion on that? Seeing uh, Mrs. Miller. Yes, and it's really just for Dr. Mayo again. Um, you had said it would be difficult to get the 20. What, what would be a reasonable number to be able to fill within a year? Because if we, if we, Okay. My concern. Thank you. My concern is if we have a number that's too high and we're not able to fill that, then that money just then goes into the general fund and, and it's basically just a slush fund for next year. So we really want to be able to fill reasonably the positions, the number of positions that we're asking for. So that, that's the reason for that question. All right. We're ready for the vote on the motion to amend to add 10 social workers at the middle school level and two social workers at the high school level um, uh, as more fully articulated by Mrs. Johnson. All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. All right, are there an additional motions on the, so Mrs. Causey and then Mrs. Hen. Um, I move that we amend the budget to add in-school student supports. Uh, I move that the proposed fiscal year 2018 budget be amended to add funding for the following staffing, starting in the schools with the highest farm ratio and the lowest counselor per student ratio to hire 23 additional guidance counselors this year. Second. Uh, is there additional discussion on that, or has there been sufficient discussion on the motion uh, to amend? I the have motion a question. Amend? Mr. Yule. Um, let's presume that we can't find 23 schools that meet that criteria. What do we do with the, the positions? The same thing we do with all the other positions we don't fill. No, no, I didn't say that. So in other words, you, as, as each school comes on board, you'll just hire to that amount. So if we only have 15 schools that meet the criteria that you outlined here, we only hire 15 counselors. Is that what you're saying? No, there, there are, every school can utilize additional counselors. Every yeah. school. Yeah, but you had, you said so the criteria I'm saying, here. Yeah, These, the criteria is so, is we, to, is I'm specifying that we start with the neediest schools that have the greatest need. That's. Sliding scale. 
Right. So you start with the school that has the highest farm ratio and the lowest counselors. You fill that school, you fill and the next school, going. you fill the next school. But if there aren't 23 of them, is my point. Then we'll have done the best we can do. Dr. No, Mayo no, no. is committed. If not hiring. Okay. If right. there aren't 23 schools that need uh, that meet already, these criteria. She's already answered that. Okay. Uh, All right. Mr. Any Mr. Other? Chairman, just a, just a simple Gross. question for Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey, to the extent you've already indicated that you trust the administration to make sure that these counselors would go to the schools where there is the greatest need for them, why then does your motion require any criteria, which then requires additional scrambling to find folks and or fill positions? If you trust the administration to go to the schools with the highest need, then wouldn't these counselors go to the schools with the highest need. Would you then, if you agree that you trust the administration, wouldn't you agree to the language that says we would add 23 counselors to our budget, period? Well, the point of uh, my motion is not just my idea, but it's the uh, concept that I've emailed over the last three weeks from key stakeholders who have done tremendous amount of research about the schools and about the counselor ratios. So I'm utilizing information that's been given to me that I have given to staff and no one has suggested before tonight that we not use that criteria. So do you trust the administration to have these folks go to schools of the greatest need? I trust the administration to follow the criteria and be able to find the schools with the highest need and then to staff them accordingly. Any other discussion on the motion to amend to add 23 guidance counselors? Mrs. Miller. I, I would support it whether it has that criteria language in it or not, but certainly there is no harm in having that language in it, so I don't know why there would be that objection. All right, we're ready for a vote on uh, the, the motion from Mrs. Causey uh, to uh, amend the budget to add 23 guidance counselors. All in favor, please rise, raise your hands. The motion carries. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, after tonight and hearing from the parents at Perry Hall Middle, I don't think there's a doubt in the room that we need to act immediately. And, um, to provide some relief to Perry Hall Middle. I move that we amend the budget to include $250,000 for a one-time comprehensive countywide middle and high school enrollment study for the purpose of addressing enrollment growth and distribution needs, which have resulted in overcrowding of area schools, including and especially Perry Hall Middle. I ask for your support. Second. Chairman, I second the motion as a board member who lives in Perry Hall. <laughs> All right, there's a motion and a second to add $250,000 for a comprehensive middle and high school bound, boundary? Enrollment study. Enrollment study. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Johnson. I have a question. I'm in support of the motion. I just want to see, if, is this a capital expense or is this an operating expense? This is an operating. Thank you, okay. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Brett. Um, can I just ask where the figure 250000 came from? Yes, that was the figure provided by the superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Dance. This is Causey. Does this include all secondary schools in the county? Yes. That is the intent, yes. Okay, thank you. I think that's important because there's other areas also. And thank you all for coming to, to really demonstrate your need. And we've also heard from other schools that have similar needs. So I think it will be really beneficial to do um, a study for the entire county. Mr. Chairman. Any other, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Um, I want to thank uh, the uh, the president of the Perry Hall Middle School PTA, who's actually working the uh, concession booth out at the school tonight. She's that committed, and that's why Lily was here tonight and spoke so ably in her behalf and persuasively. Uh, I do want to also thank my fellow board member Julie Hen for her for her significant leadership on this matter, uh, even agreeing to meet. Uh, last night uh, with Chris Hagan and the local council person, uh, and I might say my well-fed self, uh, Ju Julie and I met at Casamillas with the others, and afterwards we had uh, crab cakes from Casamillas, and we discussed other matters as well. Uh, we've said for the longest time that um, the Perry Hall Middle School 
issues are important. I've been there at Sunshine and Moonshine Alley when those classes have changed, and I've seen what goes on at, the, at, at our Perry Hall Middle School. This was an excellent idea on Julie's part. I was glad to second it, and I'm glad to support it. And any time, and I think it's your turn to pay at Casa Mia's next time. <laughs> any other discussion on this motion to amend? All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. Is there any other discussion on the budget? Yes. Mr. Birch. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. I have this motion I'd like to make. Uh, last year, the board, and I believe it was on a motion by the person who was sitting in this seat, although it is a big seat to fill, uh, made the motion that the board uh, have its own budget analyst, and that was the position <coughs> the board actually approved. Um, it did not survive the, I'm sure, the well-intentioned review of the next levels of the budget process. Uh, but three things stood out for me this year, and I had indicated at the last meeting that I would move for a budget analyst position. Um, the first uh, being that uh, um, our budget is, you know, over the past two years, I've participated in $3 billion worth of budget deliberations. And what's particularly uh, uh, noteworthy about that effort is that we found from Mr. Saris that not only is there a budget document that we're given, but that underlying it, as I mentioned at the last meeting, is another budget document with some 3,000 line items. Um, I think uh, as I look around, we have 12 uh, lay members of our board. Uh, we all have occupations and things in our lives. It would be useful to this board to have such a budget analyst position. Um, that's sort of the, the first rationale, I think, for having the, uh, the budget position. Uh, the second uh, rationale is that um, there are members who have been participating in two years. As I say, that's $3 billion for the budget deliberations. One member had to actually uh, acknowledge at the last meeting that she did not know what county funds are. Imagine the value to our board of lay people to have a budget analyst who can assist, provide support, be a resource to our uh, board members. Uh, third consideration is that there will be a hybrid board, and that board will, will take effect in, in December of 2018. It would be useful for those board members to not to have to get up to speed uh, like uh, a lot of folks have had to and are still uh, trying to get their arms around uh, these numbers, and it would be good to have that person on uh, duty when the new hybrid board takes effect. So that's my motion, and I have not yet heard a Harris. second. It, well, we haven't had an opportunity for a second. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Virch, that was uh, sufficiently Exhaustive. long winded. Exactly. That, uh, we yeah. didn't have a chance to catch catch a, a second there. So I think I heard a second from Mrs. Causey. Any discussion on Mr. Virch's um, motion to amend to add a budget analyst, uh, uh, board employed budget analyst? Mrs. Miller. Yes, and I want to thank Mr. Virch for that motion. I think that the board does need support, and this is a very complex issue, and I think after uh, a, a uh, meeting every single week for the past month. I think we can all see the wisdom in that motion. Any further discussion? Mrs. Williams. Yes. Um, Mr. Virch, do you envision this position also providing assistance to um, our executive director, uh, Debbie? I'm just asking. Debbie's our executive director? Our assistant. <laughs> to assist us. That's right. Assistant. Are we just. Well, I think. I'm just asking. I think teamwork. Because we make, asked last yeah. year for a position for her. We never got I it. I think teamwork makes education work for our board. And however, our board members, with the guidance of our chair, whoever may be in that, I think we could, we could make that work. And I'd be certainly willing to entertain modifying language. But we have to be careful about mission creep. This is a $1.5 billion budget. Um, I, I suspect whoever that special person is, he or she would be able to work most ably with my fellow Kenwood High School alum. That's great. Mr. Yulfelder. Uh, um, I, I want to be clear one thing, Steve. Are, are, is this position work for the board right. or work for the administration? God bless. There's a difference. Yes, there is. And, and that's one of the reasons both entities have their own attorneys. It would be the board's employee. Absolutely. Excellent question. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, the motion uh, is to amend the budget uh, to have a board employed budget analyst. All in favor, please raise your hands. The motion carries. Any further discussions? Mrs. Miller. Yes, I have another motion regarding STAT. Um, 
after the board has decided not to wait a year to see how STAT is doing and move forward, I'm hoping that we can do something else here. So I move that the board direct, or I move to amend the motion um, to direct the superintendent to reduce the student to device ratio in elementary schools to three to one or less per the Maryland Educational Technology Plan's recommendations. The savings shall be put toward the hiring of more instructional teachers. So there's a motion to reduce the ratio of devices to three to one. In elementary schools. In elementary schools. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, the motion fails for lack of a second. Any other motions on the, Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, talked about this at, um, this has been discussed at the last, uh, at least two meetings. Um, and I would remind the board members that in uh, the answers and questions that we received uh, from the superintendent and staff, and thank you all very much for all that work, um, that it was stated that the budget is the budget because of Blueprint 2.0. And I would remind my uh, fellow board members and, the, and staff and community that this board has not voted on Blueprint 2.0 since July of 2015. Um, so it's very important for us as a board at the highest level to evaluate what is happening in the school system and is what we're doing the best that we can do for the students, mind, body, and spirit to have the best experience in school, to come out college and career ready, um, and to achieve the most that they are capable. Um, so I am going to make a motion to have the board do a full evaluation of Blueprint 2.0 and STAT, starting at the next meeting with an agenda item in closed administrative session to discuss what process the board will use. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I understand that we were voting on a motion to amend the existing budget. If there's a motion in what my colleague has to say, let's have it so we can get it out, we can discuss second if possible, right. and discuss it. Very Otherwise, good. it's not a budget motion, as I understand what you said. Very good. And, and there's already been a motion that failed on the stat issue, so that the stat issue has already been discussed and, and voted down. And I... I heard that, but this is a motion to have the board do a full evaluation of Blueprint 2.0, which how includes is that a budget issue. Because, as the superintendent stated in the answer to his questions, the budget is the budget because of Blueprint 2.0. That it yeah, aligns to is, Blueprint 2.0. So, so these are line items with dollar issues um, that we're discussing now, and we're making amendments to either add or subtract line items, um, and uh, and having a discussion about. Um, uh, mission statement uh, seems to, I'll, I'll also add that you all know that last week I told you all that I was going to add, that we as a board are going to add to our monthly meetings discussions on this mission statement itself. So we already have built in going forward for the next year and a half um, monthly discussions on mission issues. Yes, and I appreciate you uh, doing that, but I feel that that's not enough, especially as I had stated earlier that in fiscal year, um, next year, when we discuss fiscal year 19 so frame, budget. So frame your motion so we can see if there's a second. Okay. I'll, I'll be glad to read it uninterrupted. I have making a motion to have the board do a full evaluation of Blueprint 2.0 and STAT starting at the next meeting with an agenda item in closed administrative session to discuss what process the board will use with a standing agenda item at each Board of Ed meeting, one in the administrative and one in the open session. The goal is to have any changes or improvements in an updated draft for the Board of Education to consider at its board retreat, which will be held in June or July of 2017. I, I really think that, that that is out of order for this budget discussion, but I'll see if there's a second and then we can have a vote. I think that it's the- Second. All right. Uh, there's been a motion and a second, and um, Mr. Chairman, my point discussion? of order remains out of order. I You've already that. indicated the board's, pre the chair's preference in this matter. It's, and in fact, it doesn't even deal with the budget. It, does it not. deals with a meeting it in July. Um, I think, I think that that in terms of uh, just moving forward, it's, it, we can have a vote on the motion, and and uh, you all have it in writing. Mrs. Causey delivered it to you on the pink piece of paper. All in favor of the motion to amend. As articulated on Mrs. Causey's pink paper, please say aye or raise your hand. Uh, the motion fails. All right. Any other motions with respect to the budget? Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
I move that we amend the budget to increase funding for student transportation, specifically contracted services by one million for the purpose of lowering student to bus seat ratios from three to one to two to one. Student safety has got to be paramount. It needs to be addressed countywide. We heard tonight from parents describing the very real dangers of overcrowded buses, students sitting on bus floors, standing in aisles, falling off seats because they simply have no room. This motion will go a long way in ensuring our bus riders' safety, and I ask for your support. I second the motion. There's a second from Mr. Virch. Any discussion on the motion to add $1 million to the budget for uh, the purpose of reducing bus ratios from 3 to 1 to 2 to 1? Seeing no uh, discussion, all in favor of Mrs. Hen's motion to amend, please raise your hands. The motion carries with uh, 10 votes. Any further motions to amend the budget? Seeing none, we now have the original motion as amended. I'm going to do my best to list the six uh, amendments. Uh, the original motion was to accept or adopt Exhibit J1. There have been uh, six motions uh, to it. The first, Mr. Storch, to add, uh, uh, to add a coordinator of workforce development. The second, Mrs. Johnson, to add 10 social workers at the middle school and two social workers at the high school. The third, uh, Mrs. Causey's motion uh, to add 23 guidance counselors. Uh, the fourth, Mrs. Hen's motion to uh, add $250,000 for a comprehensive middle and high enrollment study. The fifth being Mr. Virch's uh, to add a board employed budget analyst and the sixth being Mrs. Hen's motion to add one million dollars uh, for buses uh, to reduce ratios from three to one to two to one. Uh, all in favor of the motion with the six amendments please raise your hand. Uh, opposed? Uh, the motion carries uh, nine to two. All right, thank you very much. The next item on the agenda, uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tantliff for all of your work over the course of time. Um, I think that the next item. Personnel. Personnel, Dr. Mayo. <laughs> thank you for that. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, certificate appointments, and area education advisory council appointment. Is there a motion to approve the personnel matters on exhibits K-1 so through K-6? There's a, a motion. Second. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. Can thank I you, Dr. Mayo. Oh. Mayo, about the uh, Please. pie chart. Dr. Mayo, uh, thank you for the uh, continuing pie chart, uh, and especially the one talking about te teacher resignation. Uh, it's been said earlier in the meeting that we've ha we have a mass exodus of teachers. Uh, if your <coughs> pie chart is correct, we've had 123 teacher resignations out of approximately 9,000 teachers, that's about 1.3%. I would not call that a mass okay. exodus from our system. Thank you. Thank, good. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. The, um, the motion to accept, uh, approve um, uh, those items, um, K1 through K6 was voted in, in favor. Next is uh, consideration of administrative appointments. Dr. Dance. Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal Pine Grove Middle School and Assistant Principal Whitlawn High School. Is there a, a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in L1? So moved. There's second. a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very good. Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. First, I'd like to introduce the newest Assistant Principal for Whitlawn High School, uh, currently right now a Spanish teacher at Whitlawn High School, and that's Madeline Bozzilli. Madeline, congratulations. I know you have um, some Whitlawn um, folks here with you tonight. Um, you want, mind introducing them for us? Yes, I have my principal, Georgina A. You stand up, Miss A. Congratulations again to you, first year principal. 
Wow. So congratulations. Welcome. And last but not least, Assistant Principal of Pine Grove Middle School, currently right now a mathematics teacher at Stimmers Run Middle School, that's Jennifer Farmer. Congratulations. Do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? My husband George is here with me. George, congratulations to you too. Congratulations to both of you. Very good. Next on our agenda, thank you, Dr. Dance. Next on our agenda is uh, uh, agenda item M, contract awards. And for that, I call Mr. McDaniels, the chair of the contract committee. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items M1 through M11 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. All right, is there a, uh, a motion to approve items M1 through M11? So we can we pull out number two? All right, there's no reason, no need for a second, so the, the 11 are before us. You want to uh, segregate item two, and that is uh, the library management system? Yes. All right, so then we have items M1 and then M2 through M11. M3. Three through M3. <laughs> of course I said two, <laughs> but, but I was going to ask Mrs. Causey why her hand was raised first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would ask that we um, separate out <clears throat> item, well, uh, contract KSH 317-17. What number is that, Mrs. Cosby? It doesn't 11. say. Number 11. Is that the last one? Number that's 11. Seven. No, that's, that's not nice. the last one. And Say, then, give oh, give us a number again. Seven. Number seven. KSH. We told the English. Number name. seven. Construction testing. Yes. All right. So we are going to segregate or pull out numbers two and seven. So I'm gonna, I'm and gonna ask Mrs. Causey if she has another comment. Uh, and I'd like to pull out the last contract that was brought to us this evening, or it was brought to us this afternoon. <clears throat> So yeah. let me look what the agenda item is. M11. That's 11. That's 11. And that is the HVAC for Franklin and Kenwood Highs? Yes. All right. That's number 11. So okay. now I'm going to ask uh, for a vote on M1, M3 through 6, M8 through 10. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Those are all accepted. Now we'll talk number two. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. I just had some questions about the library management system. It says in the notes that um, asset manager tracks the one-to-one -one devices, um, and that's just physical devices is what it tracks. Um, do we then have a good data then on device, like damages, losses, replacements, et cetera, for the devices? <laughs> Just answering that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do. I Voice could. from the back said yes. Okay. And does the board get a report on this at any point? It's been three years since we approved this for use. It's up to the board. Okay. Uh, would it be possible for the you board? You have the data. Yes. No, we have the data. Could, could we ask for a report on that then? Do I need to make a motion? Well, let's let's vote on the contract, and then okay. then we can just ask the the administration to give us a report sometime in the in the near future. Okay, thank you. All right, all in favor of M two, please say aye. Oops, hold on. Hold on. I I have a Mrs. Causey question. Yes. So I just wanted to clarify the questions that uh, I had asked in advance and that were answered in uh, the meeting. Um, I had asked according to policy. Uh, Board of Ed Policy 3231 and Superintendent's Rule 3231 that relate to vendor performance evaluation with specific requirements for evaluations of contracts over $500,000 to be done within 30 days of installation. And it was pointed out to me that the policy actually says <clears throat> within 30 days of um, 
actually it's the rule that says within 30 days of completion of the contract. So I asked if this had had been done since the contract was for over um, $1,468,000 had already been spent. And staff said that it had not, and I asked how long it had been in use, and they said five years. So whereas the, uh, the rule talks about the completion of the contract, I did just want to ask the question, when we are approving these, uh, typically it's told to us that this number, this dollar value is spending authority, and then there's an actual contract that's entered into. So was there, in fact, a contract that was entered into for the one million four hundred and sixty-eight thousand, or for a lesser amount that was over five hundred thousand, well, it just doesn't seem to me I that we can that we can have these large contracts, these large implementations, and not have an evaluation of how it's doing. I think you're mistaking the contract authority and the contract approval. The contract approval is for an up to amount, and they and the administration can spend the approved contract up to the up to amount. Yes, and so my concern is at There's what... There's not a separate contract that comes back. So my concern is at what point is a vendor evaluation done when we are implementing all of these many different initiatives, all of these many different softwares, all of these many different um, print management and all of these other things. Um, we have this new projector installation that's gone into three schools, and unless the board... Uh, has any other thing to say about it, they're going to keep using that contract where they buy them um, and install them. So my, my question is, at what point does the can the board understand when vendor evaluations are called for and when are they done? Um, I would, I think we can ask for that to be done at our di uh, direction, but it's unrelated to the contract that we're ready to vote on, which is M2. So um, we can, just as I told Mrs. Miller in the last one, we can ask the administration to come back and, and uh, either suggest or we can suggest to them to have some kind of evaluation of the performance on um, uh, the library management system. So you will facilitate that request or add an agenda item to the next meeting so that we we'll, can clarify we, as a board? We've just done that. So Mrs. Decker has heard that, and she's going to follow up for us. Thank you very much. All right. All in favor of M2, please say aye. 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 All righty. That passes. Um, next, M7. <coughs> I think that was Mrs. Causey, and that is construction testing and inspection services. I just wanted Mr. Saris to very briefly go over for the rest of the board members who were not able to hear the um, to hear his answers to my many questions because my questions were going down a different track than what this uh, contract actually provides well, for our schools. A couple for of things. One is one is I will encourage again all board members. They, the meeting is open uh, to attend the building and contract committee. Uh, the Building and Contracts Committee meets so that it can hear and then recommend to the entire board um, uh, to either approve or not those contracts. And it would seem to me to emasculate the purpose of the committee to have um, the questions that are asked during the committee uh, recited here and re-answered here. And unless you've heard them, unless one of the board members wants to rehear it, that wasn't here, I'd say that uh, that's probably just not a good use of our time. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I note that because of the transparency that this board has brought to the processes we participate in, the contract committee meeting was live streamed. Live streamed. I can trust the diligence of our board members to take it upon themselves if they have any questions to review that footage and stop it pause it when appropriate, rewind it, and then hear what has been said again. And that's the only point of order I would share. All right. Are there any other questions or discussions about M7? All right. All in favor of M7, please say aye. 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 M7 uh, is approved. And then the last one is M11, and that is 
uh, HVAC for Franklin High School and Kenwood High School. Mrs. Causey. I just did not want this momentous occasion to go by unnoticed. Although Senator Collins is not here, <laughs> anyone that has listened to any board meeting while he was here working diligently on behalf of students in Baltimore County Public Schools, they know that this is a momentous occasion when Kenwood High School gets air conditioning. And I did not let that moment, I did not want it to go by. Mr. Chairman, I would note that I have been waiting with my fingers hovering above the keyboard to send the message to Mike Collins <laughs> Mike by Killen. email. He will never answer me, but he does secretly monitor these. He says he does. <laughs> he might answer you tonight. And of course, we're very grateful also for Franklin getting their air conditioning. Very good. All in favor of M11, please say aye. 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 And M11 passes as well. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, agenda item N, that's public comment on policies. The first policy is policy 5140. Two persons have signed up to speak. The first is Bosch Ferrone and then Marion Moore. Dr. Ferrone. Thank you, all board members. If I'm a little bit not organized, it's because of the heat. This is yeah. very high. my heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of faint. Um, Mr. Chairman, the policy is 5140, correct? 5140, Doctor. Okay. So this is a policy about enrollment and attendance, and I think it's a very good policy. However, I would like to ask about definitions. Uh, item number two, Latin, sub-item B, special permission transfer. Um, it would be approved based on specific criteria for a student to attend a school. And I, I really wonder what specific criteria. My, um, and I have really great trust with the administration and Dr. Dance, but my intention is to make sure that the criteria is really uh, justified and not discriminatory based on any other item, um, whether it's geographic, ethnic, etc. cetera. Uh, I think if the policy has reference to that, it would be a stronger policy. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Marion Moore. And doctor, I know you're st gonna stay there and that's a great idea because you're the first speaker on the next one. So just stay put. Okay. Uh, but Mrs. Moore's, Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Moore's coming up to speak on 5140. Good evening, education leaders. Happy Black History Month. Um, tonight, I would like to focus on uh, policy 5140 because I'm very familiar with it. My son's uh, education was impacted by 5140 as well as 5550. And um, I wanted to share my perspective and some recommendations uh, that could make it a little bit better for the whole child when making this decision to determine whether or not a child can remain in a school if his parent happens to be a, uh, an employee and the employee resigns. <clears throat> now, a I think a couple of months ago, I talked about my experience having a sort of like a special permission transfer when I went to high school. Um, the conditions for that contract was academic. So for example, if I had a B or better and my attendance uh, was 90% or whatever, um, just like in your contract, there the student obligations uh, or 
responsibility of this particular contract is to do well in their classes, attend school regularly and on time, and, and to be well behaved. Now, my son, for example, he was well behaved. He, his, um, academically, he was doing well and he was progressing well. But you, as board members and, and employees that um, consider keeping a child or like putting them back in the school that they had the special permission transfer, please do not add grievance to the kid. You know what I mean? So you have to have an open mind. Is my decision in the best interest academically for that child, emotionally, and socially? And may, maybe in the rules the superintendent can, can consider, you know, have that probational period. If the child is doing well and, and, and have positive relationships with everyone, then let them stay in the school. Don't cause the child to have grievance and change the trajectory of that child's education. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Mm -hmm. Moore. Uh, the second um, uh, matter for uh, public comment is policy 5150, which is students' enrollment and attendance, resident and non-resident student eligibility. Dr. Ferone, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. Policy 5150, I request that item number one dash A, that there would be an explanation or definition for the word efficient and effective. As many of my comments about policies, I really like definitions. I think they should be a footnote in the bottom. Uh, again, I have been sitting here for many years and I don't remember hearing a definition about what it means. The second one is item B. It talks about students who have domicile that are to be admitted free of charge. Free of charge. Um, I mean, public schools are not really free. We pay for it. You know, even the oxygen we, we take is paid for it somehow. So I wonder if there is some other wording that that can replace that. Last but not really least is to um, uh, specify about the tuition. Honestly, I don't know really what the tuition of the school is. However, if I contact a private school, uh, I would know that very easily. So I understand it shouldn't be exactly in the policy, but I would ask that somehow we as public know how much it costs for non risk residents to, to pay. And last but not least, since I have one minute and 30 seconds, and we are talking about domicile or not domicile, mm -hmm. uh, is the school system going to ask people uh, about their immigration status, uh, visas, uh, their national origin, do they come from Muslim country or Christian country or Jewish country or Buddhist? Um, I don't know if the PRC has addressed that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Ms. Moore. Okay. I want to start uh, off with a, a quote from the father of Black History Month, Carter G. Woodson. And um, one thing that stood out uh, in, in this book is the quote, we need workers, not leaders. Such workers will solve the problems which race leaders talk about. Believe it or not, I do not like hearing myself talk like this. I would much rather work, preferably the position that Mr. Nick mentioned earlier. That's perfect for me. But moving forward, <laughs> 5150. Um, this is going to focus on the, um, the comments earlier. I was so emotional hearing the, the, the uh, the comments earlier from um, Perry Hall and, uh, and especially Deer Park. And I've seen when people have brought things to your attention that um, maybe someone in the audience would talk to that person directly. When I heard the, the parent earlier and her daughter sitting up here talking about that incident, someone should have reached out. 
I don't know why it didn't happen. And I've seen people, you know, reach out to other people when there there's a, a, a dire need. But I saw a lot of African Americans in the back, and they even waited a little bit. No one came. That particular issue with the, the young lady, that was tugging my heart. I was crying back there. Someone should have applied policy 200. Someone should apply policy 100. I want to encourage you not to be intimidated by African American women that come up and speak passionately about our children. So I'm just encouraging you not to be intimidated, but to reach out. And you will be surprised um, you know, how we would respond because of your responsiveness to our children. So don't be afraid. Now, some other things I, I, I want to say, I only have like 30 seconds, but <sighs> there's a lot of cost that's in, involved with these policies, and I, I just hope that you um, do cost analysis uh, regarding each of these policies to um, accommodate everyone. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Rybarczyk. Thank you for the chance to comment on policy 5150. I'm wearing three hats here tonight. I'm a BCPS parent. Um, three of my kids are either going through the system now, one has graduated. Um, I also work for Baltimore County Public Schools, and I'm also a longstanding community member. Um, I think the changes in the policy that you've made have made it clearer and easier to understand. I also like that there are possibilities for exceptions. Um, I hope that the changes in the policy will also help Baltimore County Public Schools to eventually simplify the rule. And the reason I'm hopeful for that comes from my experience working in the Central Area Student Support Office over two summers as a temp clerical before I became a permanent employee, and I was working with residency. And let me tell you, there is nothing on earth like a residency office in a public school district in August. Um, this office serves my community that I worked in, um, Halstead Academy, Lock Raven Technical, and Towson High, which is my area schools. The staff at Student Support Services work hard on the residency issues this policy addresses, um, especially right before school opens. Um, I can tell you the story about the Friday before school opened last year. We had 75 families come into the office between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Unfortunately, about a third of those families had to go home disappointed because they did not have the proper paperwork. They didn't understand the rule that comes out of this policy. I can't say I blame them. It's 18 pages long, and it's constantly a source of something we have to sit and discuss with our families. A lot of the families that come to the central office for help speak Spanish. I'll tell you that last week in August before school starts, we could use an interpreter at that office like nobody's business to help us explain the rule and the policy. A lot of people think this is something we come up with. They don't understand that it's Baltimore County law, that their children have to go to school where they reside. Um, I hope that this will be addressed down the line once the policy takes effect. Um, perhaps a video on the BCPS website explaining things, maybe in more than one language. Um, perhaps explanations and presentations at PTA and PTSA meetings. Um, I think it's a lot easier for long-term residents. I mean, I know my kid next year when he hits fifth grade at Cromwell Valley Elementary, I'm going to have to go up there with my documentation in hand to get him into Lock Raven Technical. A lot of parents don't understand this. So my hope is that when this policy is affected, because it's a good one, that the rule will then be simplified and better explained to Baltimore County's families. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you thank very you. much. Our next uh, two items are our board comment opportunities, first on board committee updates and then board member comments. I will note that we're uh, close to an hour behind schedule, so I, uh, I ask that you all keep that in mind as you make comments. The first. Uh, um, committee update is the audit committee. Mr. Yulefelder? Um, the audit committee will meet next Tuesday and I will have a report for the following meeting. 
Very good. Building and contracts. Mr. McDaniels? Just uh, mentioned that we'll meet ahead of the uh, meeting scheduled uh, in two weeks and um, not extend with any other comments. Very good. Thank you. Uh, curriculum, Ms. Johnson. Yes, thank you. We uh, met January 19th and we discussed a variety of things. First was some course additions. For everybody's information, the CT, the Career and Technology Education uh, Department, added the or added the designation for GT and Advanced Academic to the Project Lead the Way Engineering courses. Um, the College of Career Ready College and Career Readiness Department added effective learning habits for college and career readiness for grade seven and grade eight, and fine arts and social sciences added art and advocacy and Japanese one, two, and three. The, um, we were also presented with a handout of all of the curriculum workshops for this summer, 2017, and as I counted, it was over 65 workshops that are being presented for, uh, for the curriculum workshops this summer. So it was really um, exciting to see, and I hope a lot of teachers take advantage of, of those workshops. We also were introduced to the NAEP grant, which furthers the board's commitment to equity, and then we were presented with two contracts. One was um, on library management system, and the second was on restorative practices, uh, restorative practices professional development, which having visited schools that are using um, restorative practices, it was really good to see. And I believe uh, it was Dr. Wisted that said this particular um, contract separates the doer from the deed, and I really liked that concept. And the next meeting is February 16th at 4.30 in uh, the E building. It's, yeah, I think it's all right here. Every, all, yeah. Yeah. To the extent that they can be there here. Uh, next is uh, di digital technology and safety. Ms. Miller? Yes, thank you. I'm very um, happy to welcome Ms. Hen to the Safety and Technology Committee. And her background is really going to add a lot to our work there. Uh, we're still waiting for information on student device time, changes to the parental privacy opt out form and hopefully an agenda item on removal of student SSNs from BCPS data records. I'm hoping that that will be on the agenda for the next board meeting. Um, our next SIT committee meeting is next week, February 15th. Thank you, uh, and policy review, Ms. Williams? Yes, thank you. Um, PRC will uh, hold its next meeting on next Monday, February 13th at 5.30 in this room. Thank you. Um, and I also do want to just share just yes, for point of um, information that the meeting is always open to the public and our agenda will be posted on the school systems website prior to the meeting. Thank you. Uh, item P on our agenda is board member comments and I'll ask Mr. Stewart to start. Thank you. So I'll be brief and I shared these words um, a little bit earlier, but I just want to say, you know, this weekend, this last weekend, we lost George Boniotis. Um, he wasn't just a school board member. He was a champion for others. Um, I was thinking about this and thinking about the best description for him. And I remember the way that Mark Shriver described his father, Sergeant Shriver, uh, as a good man. And I think there's no better description uh, than that for George because, you know, a great man might be held up for the heights that he's reached, but a good man is remembered for the body of his work and for greatness in the smaller unseen corners uh, of life. As Mark put it, wherever human interaction requires integrity and compassion. And to me, this is George. He'll be missed and his difference will be forever felt. Thank you. This is Eaton. I just want to thank the students and parents from Perry Hall Middle and Deer Park Middle for um, coming and sharing their stories with us. Mrs. Williams. Thank you so much. Um, I want to um, express my condolences to um, George Moniotis' family as well. He was a seatmate of mine for a time, but a friend always, and he will be sorely missed. I do want to also thank Dr. Ferrone for recognizing um, the work of PRC and his kind words. Um, I also want to say that I am deeply saddened by what I heard tonight uh, that is happening at Deer Park uh, Middle School. And it is my hope that um, Dr. Dance will follow up um, on that situation and the other um, situations that were expressed tonight. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also wanted to pay tribute to George Maniotis. When I came on the board, he was very kind and gracious and always very helpful to me. And he was a true advocate for public education. I fondly recall many anecdotes he told us about his positive public school experiences and the success of him and his classmates due to the excellent public education they received. My deepest sympathies go out to his family. Next, I wanted to uh, recognize that it is Black History Month, and on the um, BCPS website, there's a whole host of activities that um, are going on in our schools, all different kinds of programs. I plan to attend some, and I encourage parents, students, and community members to check the website for activities. Um, there, there's going to be some really great ones. Um, also, I wanted to comment briefly on the budget process. I do want to say that I am encouraged by the engagement of my fellow board members tonight and the many ways that I believe that we have improved this budget to try and improve the academic outcomes for our students. However, I voted no against the whole budget because I do not believe that this budget is the efficient and effective use of our dollars that we have whether they're the counties or the taxpayers or the states, however they people want to call them, we take a vote on the dollars available to us to try and do the best job for our students. I believe that there is uh, that the way that we have stat is set up that it is not financially sustainable that we need to evaluate it and I will be bringing up again to evaluate uh, Blueprint 2.0 and stat. Uh, one of the things to point out is that from fiscal year 2012 to fiscal year 18, there was an increase in the total budget of 23.4%. But during that same time, instructional salaries and wages only went up 16%. Even though we have increasing student enrollment every year, the instructional salaries are not keeping pace. And we hear constantly, as we did tonight, that the in-school uh, teacher ratio and the support services are not enough. And when we are taking money from all these programs and we don't even know what they are, um, what that complete list is, although we've heard from many people what some of them are, uh, we really need to evaluate and make sure that we're doing the best thing. The other thing is, uh, even with the way the six-year instructional digital conversion plan, and these are available on the website, from last year to this year had to uh, take a reduction um, where the county was taking the money that we, the board, did not approve for the $41 million for projectors. And it says here in the note that the uh, fiscal year 2016 county contribution for projector leases of $2.5 million that was not approved by the Board of Education and funds returned to the county in fund balance. And it says that fiscal year 2018 projector amount is redirected to one-to-one -one devices, lowering the requested county contribution, which, which means that the stat plan that we had last year was not supported by the county in the budget in going forward. And so we need to look at this and make sure, not even make sure, we're not, we're not making sure. We need to evaluate and see how we can make sure we're spending the right amount of money on technology versus all the other needs in our community. And I would like to uh, just let the community know that this is not the end of the budget cycle. This budget, this board proposed budget is moving to the county council and the county executive. And stakeholders can feel free to email their county council member their concerns. If there's something in the budget that we change that you like, ask for them to keep it. If there's something that you have a concern, ask a question about it. They do have a number of auditors that work on the budget and they can be very helpful. And I would just like to say thank you and good night. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to again acknowledge uh, George Manios's passing. Uh, George and I uh, shared a, a very special relationship. Uh, number one, we were the two oldest on the board for a number of years. And number two, we both graduated from the same high school just a couple of years apart. And uh, perhaps even more important, uh, I lose a, uh, a breakfast uh, companion uh, as we used to have breakfast occasionally. Um, I want to say one thing about the budget, and, and I, I suspect that there's nobody on this board who's ever really participated in creating a budget of this magnitude, nor has ever been in a position uh, to uh, previously approve a budget of this magnitude. When, when you approach a budget of this magnitude, 
first thing you have to do is acknowledge the integrity of the people in the system that put it together. And in addition to that, you have to acknowledge their professionalism and their skills. And as Steve said, 3,000 line items support all of this. It's a huge task. This is a big organization. And if you look at the budget of 1.6 million, at my last reading, that would put us at about the third largest, quote, business in the greater Baltimore area. Uh, so have a lot of faith and confidence in our staff, which I do, and make sure that, that we acknowledge the work that they have done to put this together. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Um, I, too, want to share my sympathy with Amani Otis family and my feeling of sadness for losing George. He was my seatmate as well for two years, and um, my first memory of George was at the board retreat, and he, we were at Carver High School, and he went running down the hallway. <laughs> And um, it was just, I was so impressed. And he was jumping, and, and he, he told great stories. He told them often. And I loved sitting next to him because he just, um, he made me smile, and he still makes me smile. Um, I also want to thank um, Perry Hall High School family and residents for coming out today and sharing your stories. And the Deer Park parents. I am enraged, saddened, and geared for action. So I've already emailed the um, PTA vice president, and I look forward to visiting the school and, and hearing further how the board and the county can help. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Sarah for all of your work on the budget and your um, and everybody in, in your, on your team um, throughout the county for for the budget work and advice and and. Uh, and counsel that you've provided to us over the last couple months. So thank you very much. Lastly, I wanted to clear up a few inaccurate or in, uh, incomplete statements that were made earlier. It was stated earlier that there was no pilot for STAT, which is incorrect. There was Lighthouse, and there still is Lighthouse, the Lighthouse schools. It was stated earlier that the MAP scores are all across the board below average in the county. That is incorrect. Many of our MAP scores in the county schools are higher than average. Uh, many of our graduates um, now have a path, we have a, the high, a higher graduation rate and a pathway to, uh, to careers, have that pathway, pathway to careers have steadily increased since STAT. We have also um, more transparency with BCPS1. As a parent with four students in the system, I love BCPS1. My students, my elementary school students, would not be, would not be happy with a three to one device ratio. The, set, the success that I have heard from our students that now uh, in high school that have the seven-day period is phenomenal. They enjoy like the, they enjoy the, the class schedule, and they're glad to have moved away from the block schedule. Um, and our funding for facilities and upgrades and central air conditioning has continued to increase since <coughs> that was implemented. So thank you very much. Mr. Birch. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, would just uh, acknowledge that George was a runner, um, and George was my seatmate for a brief while. Um, I can remember George running after Mike Collins, who was sitting here, <laughs> and so can a number of you. And that is another story for a different day. The Monty Otis family uh, it really has my, uh, has my very deepest sympathies, um, but really his is a life worth remembering. Um, I would also note, uh, as I had said once before about um, the tectonic changes that are occurring before us, and we may not know it, but this, it, it, you just can't compare, in, to my way of thinking, how our board has been operating as an activist board as opposed to the reactive board model, which some may say fit the times. Now it's I think it's becoming more activist and certainly moving in that direction. Uh, it was just last year that Marisol, in fact, made the motion for $10 million worth of air conditioning to be added. It passed. And uh, the, it didn't make it through the cuts, uh, the cut uh, when I went to the county government administration. But it was interesting in a real world what the response was uh, down the road, tens of millions of dollars for air conditioning in our county schools. And that is continuing. Um, tonight, we not only added for additional social workers and counselors, uh, we added for a uh, comprehensive plan to address overcrowding in our secondary schools. Uh, and I really, as I said, I, you know, I thank uh, Julie for her leadership on this uh, topic and the cooperation from the central office, who was in touch with Julie and I sometimes uh, on a daily, uh, if not hourly, uh, basis. 
Um, I note the expansion of transportation, another um, uh, kudos for the board, and Julie showed her leadership on the matter. Um, the budget analyst position, Nick's idea about adding to our board uh, air conditioning for our Kenwood and our Franklin schools, which almost seemed like they would never you know, make it across the, the contractual line. We should not forget the unfinished business among those items, nutritional programs for schools in our county uh, with high farm populations. Um, the county council took the initiative on this last year. They initiated a pilot program. Uh, my understanding is that we'll be receiving a report in just a short while. I'm hopeful that it is very optimistic. I'm so hopeful that I've bet Lori Taylor Mitchell a nickel that they will expand the program. Um, I would be happy to pay the nickel, but I would certainly prefer that the children get uh, additional nutrition. And there is more unfinished business for us to do. Truly, there are tectonic changes occurring, and we are moving, in my sense, in this new beginning, in a new direction, a positive activist direction. I thank my board members for all their contributions. Tonight, we have more to do. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Uh, I just want to start out by saying I think it's very healthy and necessary that we challenge the operating budget as we have and um, make sure that we're getting the expected outcomes from our investments and they are measurable. Um, so I um, am all on board. I do want to mention, though, that um, there does remain a digital divide in our county. I uh, attended a PTA meeting on the west side of our county uh, at a school that has a very high farms population, and the parents were complimentary of having devices and access to information. Every child in our county does not have the equal access to information, which is necessary to achieve in the tw 2017 year that we live. So that's real. Um, and I'm not at all suggesting that we don't uh, continue to analyze and make sure that the investment is worthwhile, but there are families that are um, uh, benefiting by our STAT program and getting tremendous benefits that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, I do want to add that um, the uh, situation at Deer Park is very concerning. I can't make the 28th PTA meeting, but I will plan to visit the school um, this week or next week or and next week, and I will work with the staff and our board members to make sure we work together toward addressing the concerns they have there. And lastly, I want to, again, um, express my extreme respect to George Maniotis, who was a real role model and showing he rarely talked about himself and his goals, but he always was talking about what was making our system and our kids better. And I have such tremendous respect for the work that he did on the board. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, I think we made some really good motions tonight on the operating budget. And uh, that, that was really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think there are some around the dais who believe we have to pass the budget even if it means capitulating through reservations that they have. And my feeling is we'll pass a budget, but we've got to pass a responsible budget. And the only way to do that is to be a responsible board. Um, my other item is... Um, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the passing of our retired BCPS special ed teacher, Elva Vensky. She taught for BCPS for 45 dedicated years. She passed on January 27th, and while I didn't know her personally, I am told by, her to, by those closest to her <coughs> that she had a heart of gold and her students adored her. She taught at Patapsco High and also Home and Hospital, and donations are being accepted by the Elva Vensky Memorial Scholarship Fund at Patapsco High School. Um, and lastly, I hope that everybody had a chance to get outside today and experience those mid-60s temperatures. It's a, a teaser, I know, but it's also a reminder to us that the spring is coming which means that the board must start to address the forgotten population of students, teachers, and staff who teach and learn in classrooms without functional AC. And I say that they're forgotten because their schools are not on the list to receive AC relief, nor are their schools covered under the heat closure policy.
These are the schools which have partial AC, meaning 50% or 50, over 50% 50 of the schools have air conditioning. Uh, but the classroom, some of the classrooms remain without air conditioning. Or there are schools in which they have air conditioning, but it's non-functional. In August of 2016, I made a motion to include these schools under the heat closure policy, but it was voted down. The board, however, did request the superintendent to furnish information on the number of classrooms affected. Five months later, the superintendent gave us half of what we requested. I've gotten no response from the board chairman on facilitating getting information on the non-functional AC classrooms. Um, and in the amount of time it took to receive the information requested, we could have had all the information plus indoor classroom temperature readings plus an indoor air quality study. I hope we will have the complete information by the next meeting so we can begin to address system needs before the heat arrives probably next month or in five weeks according to uh, Puxatawney Phil. I have also repeatedly requested an agenda item indoor air quality study, which I request to be on the next meeting. And that's all I've got tonight. Ms. Hen. Thank you. I want to thank the Perry Hall and Kingsville communities, Councilman Marks, Delegate Mealy, for taking the time to come out tonight to show support for Perry Hall Middle School. I know how hard it is to leave family, activities, and other obligations to come out to speak, so thank you very much. If there had been any doubts about the urgency of addressing Perry Hall Middle's overcrowding, you squelched those tonight through your presence and with your emails all week, which were shared with the board. Our work is far from complete. It's just beginning. I want to thank Dr. Dance for his insights and responsiveness to the concerns of the Perry Hall community, and I look forward to working collaboratively with him and with our elected officials on a comprehensive solution as well as actions to provide immediate relief. I also want to thank my fellow board members for supporting the motions tonight to fund a comprehensive enrollment study, as well as the motion to increase transportation funding to reduce student bus seat ratios. Both are steps in the right direction. Please know how much your support is appreciated. Have a good night. Thank you. Um, item Q on our agenda is uh, information items that you all uh, can look at at your leisure regarding uh, revisions to superintendent's rules and the like. Uh, we have. Um, uh, several announcements. Schools close three hours uh, only for elementary and middle students. Half day professional development on Friday, February 17. Schools and offices are closed uh, in observance of President's Day on Monday, February 20. And we meet again right here on February 21 at 6.30. We're here. Alrighty.